period of time. I've only been in real estate five years and um, I jumped right in with both feet. And I actually think that it's probably a huge mistake that I didn't get into real estate right out of high school or college um, because I'm super passionate about real estate now. I absolutely love it. It's a, a major part of my life. And I do think that we probably have one of the most honorable professions and one of the most rewarding professions that anyone could ever be in. I absolutely love selling real estate. I love everything about it. And uh, I love it so much that uh, at some point during this class today, um, or anytime when I'm public speaking about real estate, I actually get emotional. And uh, you might actually hear me have a, a, a short pause. Um, I might actually have a hitch in my throat, um, so forth and so on. And the reason is, is I'm passionate about real estate. I actually well up and get emotional about it, which is kind of crazy to think about. I do a lot of public speaking around real estate, and I want people to know that right up front that uh, I might have that small pregnant pause or you hear a little crack in my throat. I'll be looking at So why, why do I, why am I passionate about real estate? Um, it's one of those things that uh, we have the privilege of being able to work with buyers, typically buyers and sellers, but mainly buyers to, uh, to, to find their homes and, and to find where they're going to live, which is absolutely amazing. So, uh, you know, you have the opportunity to find a first time home buyer, a new home, and that's probably one of the best things that you can do, at least in my view, it's a great privilege to be able to do that. I also think that uh, finding a family, their forever home is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, another great thing is, is finding a retirement couple, helping them realize how much equity they have in their home, helping them sell that home and use their equity to actually retire is also one of the things that is incredible about selling real estate. And where I live in a resort community, we actually have the opportunity to help a family buy a multi-generational vacation home uh, where family members and grandparents and uh, their kids and their kids' kids and their grandkids can come and spend time uh, at this great vacation home. So these are the passions. These are the things I love about real estate. It's absolutely probably one of the best professions that you can have. Uh, what else can I tell you about myself? Um, anyways, I, I'm super passionate about it. And I hope that I relay that passion to you guys. So Ben and Ben, can you guys, can my other co-host introduce themselves? Yeah, I can go. Hold on, I gotta shut my door. So uh, my name is Deb Hayes. I'm with the I'm the productivity coach down here in Westford, Massachusetts. I've been in real estate for about 30 years, actually. I've been with Keller Williams about eight years and took over the coaching position about four years ago. And I'm very excited to be here. I think contract to close is a really important topic and one that you guys uh, hopefully get a lot out of. I will say we know, and you hear it every day, uh, screen on, and we really want you to participate, ask questions, throw it in the chat. You know, so they re if you have a question, probably somebody else does too. So that's my story. So I'm ready to rock and roll. Awesome. Ben, you want to introduce yourself too, even though you're following the chat? Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Benjamin Miles. I'm the Market Center Technical Trainer uh, at KW Pinnacle Central and KW Pinnacle Metro West in Central Massachusetts. Uh, super excited to be on Ignite. I run the chat. I'm going to be putting in different things of content. I already uh, put in the uh, content that you'll need for to the PDF for today. Uh, and I'm uh, I've been at KW for about two years now, uh, one as an agent from 2018 to 2019 at KW Cambridge, and now as the market center technical trainer, and I just passed my one year mark. So super excited about that uh, and ready to get rocking and rolling. All right. Awesome. Thank you so Fun much, guys. Close is a great topic. Absolutely. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um, I, I know this is going to sound odd to you guys, but we're going to take a quick break right off, right off the beginning because somebody walked into my office and there's no one else here. So let me just check in to see who they are. Okay. And I'll push them off. Give me two seconds. Managing the front desk. I like it. We all have to just do what we have to do, right? So tell me some ahas while, while he's getting organized. What, what have we learned? Give me one or two ahas for the, for your Ignite experience. 
Come on, let's have it. One of my big ahas for this uh, Ignite session that we've had over the course of the last few weeks were the individuals that really took the KW experience to the next level and not just took the lessons learned and applied them to the uh, business, but they have the growth mindset. So they're looking out for the next time they can take Ignite. They're looking mm -hmm. out for the next classes, looking to get more connected in the office, take more classes in the office, read the MREA books more, uh, and just really tune into the KW learning culture and self-education culture that we have, or at least uh, I really believe in. Super excited for this contract to close. Uh, I'm going to call on a few people that I recognize mm -hmm. from this uh, chat, from other sessions, just because I feel like it's more fun that way. So Stacy Gallagher, uh, how, how has Ignite been for you? Have you been able to apply any of the lessons you've learned thus far? Calling them out. So, uh, well, yeah. yeah so I think I'm, of myself like, Ben, going after it, calling her out. <laughs> yep. That's yep, okay. Bye, guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I have like a whole notebook of notes here that I want to go back and absorb. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, gosh, I can't even pinpoint one thing that I've learned in this class because there's just been so much takeaway. Um, and... Uh, I might not be able to articulate it very well, but it's all up in here in for sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's really helpful um, to have, obviously, knowing how to use command in, in those specific forms, like Google Forms, how to edit your own um, buyer and selling listings. Um, some of those real, uh, we can listen to, you know, how to prospect and how to market and how to um, kind of do all those things and, and how to, you know, but it's not real world application yet. But I think for me, some of the biggest ahas were the things that I can actually go and do now, like edit my buyer guide, edit my seller guide, um, do my pre-listing pre questionnaire through a Google form. And so those real world like applications that I can do after is probably my biggest takeaway from Ignite. Sweet. Thank you, Stacy, for sharing. And Ben, thanks for calling her out. <laughs> yeah, uh, Roberto, do you have anything to share? You've been with us on many different sessions, so I, I have you pulled anything good out of this? No, for sure. No, I mean, I'm ever so grateful of actually having <coughs> been able to attend every single session thus far and today being the last. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is the realization, and we talked about it yesterday, the realization that we are, um, you know, in, 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 we, we're not private contractors, as somebody said, we are more of a, a small business owners. Um, yeah. And with that come a commitment to, towards, you know, when, you know, specifically it's lead generating and, and really looking for, uh, for the business. So I've adopted that immediately, almost on day one, and maybe not on day one, maybe on day two. Um, but the regimen of the 10, um, adding 10 contacts a day, having uh, 10 or trying to have 10 real estate related conversations a day, it really changed me from the standpoint that it made me um, put myself out there more um, and I think on day one, somebody said, don't be a secret agent. And I keep yeah. reminding myself of that. It's like, don't be a secret agent. And anybody that you kind of encounter and anybody that you are able, that you happen to speak with, just let them know what you, this is what you do nowadays and, and how can you be a resource to all of them, right? So I think the, the mindset has really um, hit home for me. That's awesome. awesome. Really cool. You know, it's interesting, just in the five years, we've changed from, uh, it used to be 10 conversations a day to, to, uh, to now, I mean, two conversations a day to now 10. Um, you know, just, you know, when I started getting into it, it was about have, have two. Um, but in this particular market, 10 is probably the target we need so that we can create more listings. So let's get into the, uh, let's get into the contact here. We're going to, I'm going to try to apply as much real world as possible um, you know, situations that I've come across and that I've had and experiences that I've had um, throughout my career and uh, oh, how yeah, I can apply them to the topics that we have here at hand. Um, for sure, anybody has any comment at any time, uh, please interrupt me, put your hand up, um, shout it out. If you have questions, comments, 
um, concerns, whatever you got, please hit us up with it. This is interactive. This is for you and not necessarily for me. Um, although my grandmother used to say I have a face for television. So this is a perfect, perfect um, <laughs> format for me. Um, although after a couple of broken noses, a few punches to the mouth, probably not that face for television that I used to have. So what we're going to learn today, negotiate contracts, uh, transaction man management to get to the close, uh, vendor management, which is super important, and compliance and risk management. Some of the most important things that we're going to talk about today are relationships and the relationships that you have with not only the other people in the industry, the co-brokers that you work with, but also your vendors. Um, they're huge to have great relationships with the vendors in your community. Um, you should also know that all the stuff that we're going to talk about is, and it's probably been this way through the entire process, is that um, every single region that we work in are, are different and unique. So some things that I might talk about might not apply in your marketplace. Like one of the things that we have to do in a rural market is, uh, is scope septic systems. Uh, pump the septic tank and then go to scopings. Not one of the jobs that you want to uh, be present for, but you kind of have to be. So, but it's not a pleasant experience. Um, so um, let's go on to the next slide, if you don't mind. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to build, um, this would be great if we were in person because we could actually do it on a whiteboard and actually draw our timeline. But it's all about uh, building your timeline from actually when you execute the actual contract, get the contract, and what the best practices are as we move through the timeline. Um, we're actually going to break into groups. If we're prepared to do that at some point here, we're going to break into groups and build our own timeline and actually go through the process of what do we do when we execute a contract? What are the steps involved? Each region is a little bit different. Um, but there's tons of things that have to do from when you sign the contract to actually getting to close. Who's actually purchased a home here? Has anyone actually gone through the process of buying their own home? Amanda, after you sign the contract, how, what was the experience like for you? Uh, in what way? Just working with the lender, the home inspection and all of that jazz? Yeah. Were you surprised by all the steps that you had to take? Yes, we were. But we were also an unusual circumstance because uh, we my it was my husband who was getting the mortgage. Um, and as a foreign national, it was just a different situation. Um, okay. so it was a lot, lot, lot more red tape and arduous and um, more, you know, documentation and um, finding the right lender that would support us. Um, it was, it was, it was long. It was much longer than I think that the buy the seller wanted, but uh, we won't, <laughs> so thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? That's actually a really challenging one, right? I mean, mm. you know, uh, it would be huge to go through that process. Anyone else have any? Yes, Jacqueline. Oh, I was just going to say that um, I did, um, I did help a buyer. I, you know, go from, you know, looking to all the way to close. Yeah. So, and how was um, that? It actually, it actually went really smoothly um, because <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's just relative or, or, or what, because um, I also, at the same time, I've been trying to sell a house and um, it was a lot of problems because the owner, um, you know, she, she insisted that there were no problems with her house and it was a three, you know, hundred year old three family house that she's been renting, you know, she's owned for 30 years. And so obviously, you know, your renters don't take it, but it turns out like the whole house was knob and tube wiring. Oh. It, and, you know, she's lying about it the whole time. She's, I don't know if she's like, was purposely lying or she was just oblivious or, you know, she just, everything was oblivious, you know, like things like uh, holes in the wall. You know, I said on the disclosure, you have to put that, you have holes in the walls. Well, they're not, they're just from people moving in. And I'm like, 
but they're holes in the wall, so you have to put <laughs> it. It's like that's that was you know it was just it's, so, and and then finally you know I sold it once and the person backed out because of the um, inspection report. And then I really found out what was all the things that were wrong with the house. She refused to look at the inspection report because she said the home inspector came to her house and made up a bunch of lies. And um, so I did find a second buyer, which was perfect because he just wanted it as an investment property and he had a lot of money, but then we get all the way to closing and there's a title issue. And um, the title issue has been a nightmare because we were supposed to close October 29th. And um, the buyer pretty much, uh, I have till Monday to, try to rectify it and I've tried every which way to rectify it, you know? That's and, unbelievable that it, we're talking three months later and you're still, and they're still hanging on. Yeah. Because, um, that's they're great. Hanging on. Yeah. Because I mean, he, he really wanted the property. Number one, number two, the lawyers kept saying that it was going to be like, you know, they kept saying, okay, there's a way through this. We, we can do this and then it will be all set, you know? So yep. it just kept, it, but then that didn't work. Then this didn't work and that didn't work. Turns out we were um, trying to contact, you know, how she had, she bought the house like 31 years ago. So her title insurance company was um, bought up or absorbed or whatever it is, you know, by one of these larger companies, like, um, you know, so many of them have been. Um, so they thought that it went to First American. So we were we were contacting First American for like a month, wasting our time when really we should have been going after Fidelity. So I just started with Fidelity. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just um, a matter of seeing if, you know, the other thing she the 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 woman selling the house at this point, she's like just done with all of this crap. You know, she's just so stressed out about yeah. selling yeah, it. Sounds and like a tricky one. It, yeah, yeah, yeah a, and she had to clean out her whole house. You know, you can imagine how much in a 4,000 square years. foot house after 30 years raising her three daughters there, <clears throat> you know, and just having tenants and this and that. You can imagine how much stuff is in the house. And so that was stressful. We were on a deadline for the closing, and then the closing never happened. And yeah, um, so there's just, there's lots of things to learn in that particular one. There, I mean, there's I, lots got, of I learned stuff to so unpack. much. I gotta say, yeah. I learned so much because I learned how to, you know, have an open house, two open houses. You know, I had to have two. You know, I had more than two, but you know what I mean. I had to prepare for two different you know, yeah. things. And then so, the second so had time I had to, for, yeah. for the two different things and it, the, the, the closing pro process can be, uh, be, yeah. be difficult. Uh, did, did anyone yes. else have an experience? Uh, I, I know that, uh, Mr. Gupta, uh, in the chat, uh, said that you did. Could you tell us about your experience as well? Yeah, sure. So I am more into the investment properties and uh, I buy the investment properties uh, on a regular basis. So uh, my experience, I can share like a couple of experiences. The, the lawyer has to be very good, has to be tested. If attorney is not good, things can go in any direction. So that's a problem. I had like very bad experience uh, not buying from not buying for myself, but selling to my um, my buyer the investment property. So that that <laughs> the lawyer one mistake created the whole mess and deal fell fall apart. So uh, lawyer has to be very very good when we are dealing with closing. So uh, that's why we need to have the uh, very 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 cautious on that. So Absolutely. that's my that's 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 my perspective on that. And second thing is the dates has to be chosen correctly. Like uh, when we are offered to purchase and sales too close, 
because sometimes if you're too aggressive, uh, things can fall apart. And if you're not, uh, if you're like too, you have to choose correctly, make, uh, depending on like the bio condition, how much time you will take to get the mortgage and all those kind of things. So those are a couple of experiences I can, uh, I, I felt that those awesome. are important. Thank you, sir. So a couple of things I want to pack out, uh, unpack here is, is um, a few things. First off, knob and tube. Like what is knob and tube? Does everyone know what knob and tube is that Jacqueline was talking about? Knob a and tube nightmare. Is, uh, yeah, a nightmare and super dangerous. <laughs> so everybody yeah. knows what knob and tube is? Yeah, nightmare electrical stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the other thing that she talked about was her buyer is uh, an investment buyer, right? So they're an investment property. Two things that you should really know about the differences between an investment buyer and a someone that's buying for their own property. There's major, right. major differences in the two people. Um, one is, is if you're an invest, dealing with investment or commercial property, which essentially a duplex or a triplex or you know um, some sort of multifamily, if you're working with an investment property buyer, there, it's, there's not a lot of emotions involved. Essentially, it's right. numbers. It's just numbers. They don't care about colors. They don't care about, typically they, they care about conditions, but not a whole lot. It's, and they're not worried about uh, moving in to. Correct. There's no like concern the, about moving in. They're right. not worried about that kind of stuff. They want to yeah. know what, what the rent roll is. They want to know yes. what the bottom line is. They want to know what the PL is. They want to see the schedule C. It's numbers. It's not emotion. They don't have a lot of emotional contact. So there's positives and negatives to that. But the major positive is, is that it's down and dirty. There's really not a whole lot of thinking about it. They don't care. They just want to know the numbers. When you're working with a residential, if someone's actually buying, like those things that I'm passionate about, that I told you about at the beginning, selling a uh, finding a, a first time home for somebody or finding a family, their forever home, um, those things, there's more emotions in it. So we're, as we go through this process of from when you execute the contract to the close, there's all kinds of ups and downs emotions. And while we're doing that, going through that process, not only are we their realtor, sometimes we're actually their counselor, uh, their friend, um, and hopefully helping them go through the roller coaster of emotions that, that they will be going through as we try to get to that close. Um, I'll tell you a couple of experiences that I had um, that we, we ran into personally. I had one property and two sales on it, um, at one that failed, and it was essentially um, got complicated because the buyer wanted to purchase the furniture. And I always tell people, look, I'm not a furniture salesman. I'm a real estate agent. I sell real estate, not furniture. In a resort market, though, what often happens, though, is if someone's buying a second home and they want to buy the bedroom furniture, they want the couches, you know, they don't want to spend a whole lot of time going out and buying furniture for their second homes. So you end up having to add an addendum with a list that needs to be approved of all the different uh, furniture that wants to be kept. Then there's another list of exemptions that they're going to take. So it gets a little complicated. Um, it also gets tied up in values. So the homeowner always thinks that the value of what they say is uh, the value of what they own has more value than what the buyer thinks, right? I literally lost a contract because the homeowner thought that the 25 year old um, furniture uh, in the bedroom, the master bedroom furniture was worth $6,000, uh, which is probably what they paid for it. 25 years ago and the buyer thought it was worth 1200 and he was not willing to negotiate at all he said 1200 and that's it we lost the deal over the 1200 dollars for the furniture um, the difference between 1200 and 6000 so um, anything can end up blowing up a contract and um, if you ever do get involved in a deal where they're talking about buying the furniture um, that has to somehow be communicated almost separately from the contract. In my area, we actually can work them into the contract, um, but mortgage companies never like to see that, by the way. Can't mortgage furniture. 
So it somehow has to end up being outside of the deal. Um, typically what we end up doing is, is saying that the property is transferred without with no value, um, you know, the, the, uh, the furniture. So here's something too that you should know. We ended up similar title search issue um, when you, when uh, you end up having a title search issue, there's all kinds of different issues that can have, that can cloud the title. Tons and tons of different issues that can cloud a title. The one that I ran into when we got a second contract on this deal was, which almost squashed the deal, was um, not knowingly the, uh, the, buy, the sellers actually had a, um, a, still had a lien on their property from a mortgage that was many, many years old. And they had no idea um, that they still had this lien on the property. And, um, and it was basically because multiple different uh, banks had purchased the bank. So it was, you know, it was MNT Bank and then it went to People's Bank and anyhow. So they still had a lien on the property from a mortgage company. And this particular uh, family moved to New Zealand and we were packing up their property for them. We had hired a mover to come in and pack their property. So um, they thought for sure that they had um, their, their original mortgage docs and they told me that at their payoff for their original mortgage, and they gave me instructions from New Zealand, where to go in the office, which box to look in. And I had to actually go in and go through all their private paperwork. And I actually found the payoff for the mortgage. Um, kind of crazy, crazy story where it was. It was like nuts. But anyhow, uh, the pitfalls that you will find are unbelievable. Yes, Mr. Gupta, you have a comment? Yeah, so my... Just a very small question. On the solar panel, right? When you're selling the house with solar panel, yes, sir. Without the solar panel, can you just tell us like the like like kind of like a lean issue with that? The solar panels, people generally have the lean for 20 years. How does that affect the cell or does it it doesn't affect at all? Yeah, I mean there's definitely uh issues with with uh Solar panels. So th there's two different options. There's solar panels that are owned by the homeowner, and there's also solar panels that are um, that are leased. So if they're owned by the homeowner, there's no issue, right? Comes with the property. If they're leased, you need to actually get the lease and understand the details of the lease lease agreement, whether that can be transferred or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so is that a negative to have the solar panel when the seller is trying to sell the house or it's not a negative? Absolutely not. It's positive. Okay. Adds value. It, it adds a ton of value, especially if they're home, if they're owned. Okay. Let's move on. Any other questions as I'm rambling on about issues that I have with closings? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so uh, Build a buyer's timeline. So do we have groups set up that we can break out into groups? Yeah, we can go into breakout sessions for sure. All right, fantastic. What I want you guys to do is, um, like I said, if we were in a group here, we'd be able to do it on a whiteboard and go through all the things. There's tons of different things that you might have um, when, you, uh, when you go from an executed contract to close. And I'd love you to put in, um, in this timeline, when you break into your groups, if we can have you guys talk about the events that happen or the milestones that happen from when you execute a contract to the close. Each of you will have different ones, but let's build timelines. And then when you guys come back, we can actually uh, go over them. All right. All right. So you want them to, all right. So you want them to in their head, think about, okay, we're going to execute a contract. Is this the buyer timeline that he's going to execute nope. a contract? I, yeah, I think what we should do, though, is, is have two different, if we have a couple of groups, pick whether you're going to do a buyer or a seller, because okay, there's yeah, different yeah. timelines, and then we can come back and talk about the different ones. So if when you get into a group, choose whether you guys want to do a buyer one, or if you want to do a seller one. And okay, actually, what do you want for, this, and what do you want for timeline? Uh, the milestones that you would get that you might run into from when you execute so when you close, Deb, you have something else, don't you? You're thinking something else. No, I was saying, how long do you want the breakout Ten session minutes. to be? 10 minutes, okay. Sorry. All right. Everybody you and I will get working together here soon, Deb. We'll figure this all out. Trust <laughs> no me. No worries. 
All right. So everybody know what the the uh, the exercise is. You're gonna go in. You're gonna figure out the timeline as a uh, whichever you guys decide. Somebody take the lead on that. All right. It's gonna go now. Options. Let's make sure we get ten and go. So you should be able to join in your groups. It'll go. Should go. Got a few people left here in the main room. Yeah. It's people who probably aren't, you know. Someone's actually just joining in. Yeah. So I'll jump on to something. I see Jen's. But Deb, before we do go, I want you to, um, I got your message there. We should get back into the program. We have a few chatty people. So I'm going to yeah. try to balance that as best I can. And I have, yeah. which is a it, problem. It is a little tricky, but that's okay. That's how it is always in Ignite. So, you know, that's, you know, just keep following your, your program here and we'll keep at it. Yeah, I'm I was glad that... one of them, see what they're doing. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see who needs, I don't know. I'll just jump into this one. No, let's see. Yeah. I'll join. Just see what happens. You I'm joining three. So. Okay. Jessica Litchfield. Yes. 
Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fantastic. You just joined, I'm assuming. I did. Or did yes. you get pumped out? Can I add you to a, um, we're in work group right, right now. Can I add you to one of those? Would you like sure. to do that? We're talking about at building a timeline from contract to close and what the different milestones are. Okay. I'm going to put you into group two. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, and 
up right here in front of you. I was going to come through it and find the calculator that's in the school and share that stuff with you because it's like too hard. Yeah, I'm not sure that three or five staff and five years you guys have to find your Yeah, Steve and I will go over it. We need to have a meeting with me and Steve as the you know wisdom expert if you want to be considered him to say I totally psyched for getting something like that for you. So yeah. you're gonna have the problem. I luckily had the first closing for the routine. That was a fast closing. We did great. Right. Got it signed, closed in five minutes. Oh, it always works. It's that simple. No, it's not. So, you know, again, keep you know, follow a little bit of that pattern, but obviously check with your own market center, your TLs, your compliance people, you know, what is the custom in your own area, but that's kind of what we do. All right, we slowly coming back in. Yeah, it takes a minute. I'm still working the front desk. Oh gosh. My partner had a baby, well, not my partner. He didn't have a baby yesterday. <laughs> His wife had a baby yesterday, so. Oh. It would be a miracle if Steve had a baby. Well, you know, he was there. He was there. Actually, he was there. Not only was he there, he actually participated in the delivery. He's That's a cool. EMT. Oh, my so gosh. He got continuing education credits to be a part of the birth, which is oh kind of crazy. Gosh, that's crazy. But when, when did you guys get back? Boy, mm -hmm. I just left a breakout room and somebody's getting credit for helping with a delivery. I know, it's just, that's how it goes. That's how fast <laughs> You guys it had a moves. different list for your closing because <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't think we got mm -hmm. to the helping with the birth uh, part of our- <laughs> So how did, everybody, how did everybody do with their exercise? What is that? Let's, hear, let's hear, get some feedback on that. So group one. Who from group one can tell us, first off, what did you do from group one as uh, did you do buyer or seller? And what were some of the milestones? I, I have to admit that um, we probably should have asked more questions before we went in the breakout room. Um, there were, well, most of us didn't, didn't quite understand where we were supposed to be with that. We did discuss milestones. We, we got into home warranties. We got into, um, you know, when the title gets searched. We also kind of came to the conclusion that, um, a lot of these things start uh, kind of at the same time. You kick them off and get them going earlier, um, where the timeline looked like you'd get one started and finish it and then get the next thing started. It, we felt like it was all kind of at the same time. Right, so if you look at the screen, can you guys see build the buyer timeline? Yes. All right, so that's kind of what, what, what we're doing here. You've got, ex you execute your contract, woohoo. They work with the lender. They've already been working with their lender, but they need to do their application and get in there for real. Then we looked at the next step is the home inspection. And then of course, you know, we move forward to the mortgage um, commitment and all the documentations. And obviously they have to get their uh, insurance and then warranties if necessary and close. And we came out to about a 45 day window. Did anybody come up? Maybe another group can share. Jacqueline is raising her hand. Oh, I just had a quick question. Where would you find um, the chain of title, like a full, the full chain of title? So title is something that we actually don't do, right? I mean, yeah, depending no. on what state yeah. you're involved in, if you're, um, you know, in Massachusetts, you have title companies. So the title company actually does that. In the state of Vermont, we are not a title company state. We actually have attorneys that handle the titles. Okay. And um, you, the attorney handles the title. We don't do any sort of title search. We're not qualified to do it. We're not trained in that. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of different things that come involved with the title. Um, but so, so if I you think, needed something like that, if you needed like a, a a chain of title, then you would have to go to a title closing company. attorney. Yep, exactly. Uh, it has to go okay. come through them. Okay. So like, right, like cool. what Deb was saying, and going back to what Sam said, um, you do essentially start everything off right when you get the closing, right when you get the contract executed. You want to get everything sort of going. However, there's different timelines for all the different functions, right? So working with the lender, as Deb said, that's probably the first thing you need to go need to do. Um, hopefully your 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 uh, clients 
in the buyer side has actually gotten a pre-approval so they know who to work with, right? And then you actually have to get the full application done. In Vermont, we give about five to seven days for the buyer to go out and actually get their application filled out, okay? And actually do the application. This is important, by the way, because not a lot of home buyers, if you're working with a new home buyer, they don't understand the difference between getting a pre-approval and getting their full application completed and clear to close. So when you're working with a financial lender, there's essentially three major milestones for the financial lender working with your buyer. So there's the pre-approval, there's the application, and then there's the clear to close. And those all go in different time. They're all in different times throughout the actual process. Pre-approval is prior to making the offer. Filling out the application is just after getting the contract executed. And then clear to close is typically, depending on where you are, about five to seven days prior to the closing itself. And all that should be contained within your financial contingency, okay? So it does start at the same time, but they all have different timelines, all right? Mm -hmm. Who else has something else? What's another milestone besides the financing deal? What else do we have that we would need to get done? Anybody, some from the other groups. Group two. Come on, volunteer. You have to do uh, get the contracts done. Explain what you mean by that. Uh, so if you're doing a buyer, the exclusive buyer representative forms. Right. Okay. So what? it's a good point, Ryan. You want to make sure that those are actually completed and executed. However, those should be completed and executed prior to actually executing the contract. So you're, what Ryan's talking about is, is a buyer... Uh, an exclusive right to represent buyer. That's what it's called in Vermont. That's what we use. You want to make sure that's signed. And by the way, make sure you check the dates on that so that you're dating. Um, let's say it, it took six months to work with your buyer, right? And when you end up getting this um, exclusive right to represent your buyer, you want to make sure that the dates fit into the whole entire timeline here. So you go back and check that to make sure that if your closing is closing on, let's say January 31st, your right to represent them as a buyer doesn't expire the 15th of January. Right. You might have to have them re-sign that, okay? Right. Okay, Anyone so I, I, I was also in um, Ryan's group and I shared that what I learned was to have bankers, inspectors, uh, anybody and everybody list for people, for um, first time home buyers, they have no clue what, uh, who to use, where to go. So Love I have it. that list ready and it really helps. And also yeah. because I've used those people often enough, I call them easily. They sometimes push me to the top of the list with my clients. It just makes things go a lot smoother. Linda, that is awesome. That's a fantastic suggestion for sure. And by the way, you should have multiple options, right? So mm -hmm. if you have lenders, you should have two or three. And I would advise a local bank, uh, a, a uh, community bank, a large bank, have a variety so that you can give your clients Ooh. options. We want to give them options. We don't want to say, call my friend Anita at the local bank down the corner. She'll take care of you. Um, we don't want to do that. We want to provide multiple options. And having a list, a document that has not only lenders, home inspectors, plumbers, um, you know, all the different stuff that you're going to need, need insurance companies, all that stuff, have it on one document so that you can actually provide it for them. Make sure if you are providing it for them, send it to them in, in an email and have it as an attachment so that you actually can track that stuff. Sam, you got a question or a comment? Uh, actually, it's, it's kind of a comment. I noticed that Michael did not list Rocket Mortgage and or any of the big internet ones, because that is not what people are looking for. You don't want to roll into a, a conversation um, with somebody pre-approved by Rocket Mortgage, because that is not nearly as powerful as saying, hey, the guy from Central Bank right down here has a pre-approval. He's in our neighborhood. He's here. He's on the ground. And he knows us. That is a much better stand place to be. These internet ones, um, I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's somebody somewhere who needs them, but uh, that's not going to help you in a negotiation. 
So I'll tell you a good story on that, Sam. I don't disagree with you that it is a challenge when you present a pre-approval and it comes from one of the big brands. Um, it's it sometimes, you know, it it tends to add, the listing agent asks more questions than if it's at your local bank. That it's if it's with my friend Anita down on the corner, everybody gets it. However, I have to be honest with you. I just did a closing um, about last year, end of last year. And it was Rocket Mortgage. And when they told me that they were working with Rocket Mortgage, I thought, oh, no. Um, you know, but you want to keep your smile on. OK, this is the people they want to deal with. And they told me they've had great experiences. They purchased three homes through Rocket Mortgage. Super, super successful. And I was going in dreading it. But it was a fantastic experience, to be honest with you. It was really, really good. The communication that Rocket Mortgage has been better than any communication I ever had. And they literally, the their loan officer called me at every single milestone mm -hmm. that they, as they were going through the process, it was shockingly surprising. So, um, I had, but I don't I had, disagree with you. It definitely adds com some confusion, some concerns for the listing agent. They're always like, oh, really? You're going to use that one that I saw advertised on the Super Bowl? Okay. <laughs> Linda, did you have another comment? I had, the same, yeah, I had the same experience. I had a buyer from Texas trying to buy in Vermont and he couldn't find a bank you know, here. And so um, he couldn't find a Texas bank that would, would finance it. So he went with Rocket Mortgage and he told me, and I was like, oh no, it was the smoothest transaction I've ever had. And it Isn't was the fun? fastest closing I've ever had. So I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else have anything that has to go into this timeline? Is everybody Any clear on the timeline and the, in the, we, in we the, have, we have a comment in the chat, agency cool. disclosure and lead paint disclosure. Ah, fantastic. These are definitely things that you need to know, right? So um, let's talk about uh, lead paint. If the house was built before 1978, you need to talk lead paint. If it was built before 1978, you wanna make sure that you have a lead paint disclosure in there that the seller fills out. As the buyer, you wanna make sure that you're requesting that. Okay, that we're talking buyer timeline right here. Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest things that we need to do, we're not talking about, um, it's, it's here, is home inspection. Home inspection is huge um, because it, a lot of places and a lot of agents use home inspection as a negotiation tool after the home inspection. I don't happen to be one of those, but some of you might be. Um, when you're doing a home inspection, there's all kinds of details that come into home inspections too. It might not just be hiring the home inspector. If you have something like a chimney that needs to be cleaned and inspected, it's not the same person, or at least in my market, it's not the same person. Same thing with septics. If you have a septic system that needs to be cleaned or emptied and inspected, it's not the same person as a regular home inspector. Home inspector does general stuff in the house, foundations, um, structures, you know, making sure the washer and dryer work, all those sort of functional things. Um, you want to make sure that you're lining up within your timeline in, in Vermont, where I am, we use uh, between 14 and 21 days to get the home inspection completed. And you need to make sure that all of your contacts, your septic pumping, your scoping septic lines, those are two different people as well, not always the same company. Um, if you have a chimney that needs to be inspected, um, the home inspectors don't always inspect the furnace. So if your client wants to have the furnace inspected, you might need to hire an actual plumber to come out and inspect the furnace. So there are a lot of people involved in this, in this and you want to make sure they're all scheduled before the end of your timeline for home inspection. And in my case, it's 14 to 19. Someone just threw in the in the chat, radon, another good one, really good one. Radon, water test too. Whenever you talk radon, I always think water testing because radon's not very difficult to remove from the air because you can just use a mitigation system that's pumped into the house. They have to drill a hole in the concrete floor. They can get the radon out. And if you have radon in your water, really hard to get, it, get rid of radon in the water but you can do it. Ah, Title V. Title V. What's Title V? Can anyone from Massachusetts tell me what Title V is? I happen to know what Title V is, but anybody. Jacqueline, did you put your hand up to explain Title V? Oh, no. I was going to say, um, 
I was going to say at the end for a seller, you need to get the final sewer bill and final water bill. And yes. if you have oil, you have to get, you know, um, a note from the oil company, you know, stating how much is left and how much they paid, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, yeah, anything sure that's, that's going to be a credit. Yeah, yeah all that be... needs to be done prior to closing for sure. Uh, yep, Jessica and, uh, Litchfield, you put your hand up to explain Title V quickly, or at least you wrote it in the chat. Jessica? All right, Title V is a law in Massachusetts where you have to get a, a, a private septic system inspected by a uh, licensed or certified inspector for the state of Massachusetts. And uh, if you have a private septic system, you need that certification before you can transfer your house. It's not something that's anywhere else. It's happened to be very, very specific to Massachusetts. And uh, not a lot of homes in Massachusetts have septic systems, but there are some. By the way, I lost a deal in Vermont. I lost a deal in Vermont because the people from Hopkinton, Mass, could not sell their house because they had a Title V issue. And the timing just did not work out. They ended up finally selling it. But this was one of the, so in this particular case, they were on the seller side and, and this timeline failed for them to actually end up um, buying a house in Vermont. So Which is anything kind of else in here? Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Deb. I was gonna say that's kind of interesting um, as we move forward into building a seller timeline. Uh, these are the things that we'll have to think about. Um, and um, all of these, all of these, what we call uh, problems that come up, you know, we have to figure out how to avoid these risks. You know, what do we do? You know, it's called risk avoidance, risk avoidance and best practices. So we'll 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 dig into those things as we move forward. So if you're doing a seller timeline, the buyer timeline, we kind of got a little bit figured out. We've got execute the contract, work with the lender, get your home inspection done. And again, we'll dig into those because that, that you could be there for nine years talking, you know, uh, yes, they need to get their homeowner's insurance. Different states have different feelings on home warranties. And then, of course, we go to closing. So we've got that timeline. And these are the things as a buyer agent you need to focus on. So let's what do you think about the seller timeline? They have sort of a different stuff they have to think about. So maybe we brainstorm a little bit. Right. What are the milestones for them? They're in a different brain wave at that point. Right, Mike? You know, yeah, so what do we got? I mean, let's talk about that. Who, yeah, let's who kind of brain, instead of going into groups, let's just mastermind it here. Um, what is the timeline on the sellers thing? How does that work when they start when they get an offer? Woohoo, then what happens? So you guys should take notes and keep track of this. Woohoo, Deb. <laughs> so what do we got? So you got a contract signed, you got an offer, contract signed. What is next? So one, one big thing that I like to always point people to is the buyer guide and the seller guide that you have free and available to you within your KW command system. Love if that. everyone wants to right now, I would love to show you where the, that is located within your command system. Uh, would that work with everyone, Deb? Yeah, sure. Work? I mean, what do you think, Mike? I would pop Michael, that up. It's, that work? Show, show them where to get it. That way they have it. And then ben, as do you want to share your screen or do you want me to? Yes, yes. I can share my screen. Would All right, you, you can go for it. I, I was ready to run it, man, but you can do it. Let me uh, let me make you the co-host again. Perfect. I, I, this is where my, I love to work. This is why it's men. good to have a, a tech trainer in Ignite because yeah, we absolutely. talk all about all this stuff, but Sometimes it's a little hard, you know, command is a beast. It's a big thing. And to have somebody just be able to pop you in. So like start like kindergarten style, where do we start? Perfect. So when you first open up command, you're going to start off in the welcome home section. This, you have your dashboard here. We're not going to talk about it right now. What we're going to do is we're going to hit the red KW in the top left-hand corner. This will toggle over the information what these symbols mean. You want to do this every single time you jump into command until you have what these symbols represent memorized. So if you hit this right when you come in, you can see you, we want to jump down to consumer. 
under consumer, we can really edit and make changes to our website at scale. So we can do uh, agent site pages right here, landing pages, and guide builder. What we're going to talk about right now is guide builder. The guide builder is set up in order to guide your consumer all the way through the process on how to buy a home or how to sell, it, to sell a home. This is live with all of your uh, uh, individuals in this. So we're going to jump into this. So the buying guide. So if they open up the guide on their app, on the consumer app that they've downloaded from you, they'll open this up and they'll have start your search first. Now start your search will have a breakdown. Uh, it won't show me because I'm uh, currently on Zoom right now, but uh, it has a breakdown of all of the different, uh, basically the first step in the buying a new home is for us to identify the neighborhoods you can want to live in. So basically it has a description of how they start their search. Uh, so that everyone knows too, Ben, sorry, just not to interrupt you. If you can click on that one again. Yes. Click on it again. This is all editable. So you can edit yourself, right? So if you want to replace the image, you can change the image to make it something that, that's more suitable to your marketplace. You can ask also change the subtitle and the description. That's all editable for you specifically. So you can take the time to go through and edit that. Exactly. And you can also, can you show them, Ben, how they move up and down? So if somebody wants to change. Yes, I, I, I'm that? going to be getting to that. I'm going to be getting okay, good. to that. So want to make within sure each detailing. of these, you have the different steps. You have different, uh, more content on each of these. When you come down, we have, what can I afford? Get free approved, tour homes, make an offer execute contract, home inspection, home insurance, home warranty, and close. The thing I really like is when they go through on the app at start your search, they'll be prompted to reach out to you. At what can I afford? It's an affordability calculator for them. At get pre-approved, if they're not pre-approved already, it'll prompt them to get with Keller Mortgage. Then uh, when they get to tour homes, this is just more content. Like uh, Mike was saying, we can come in here and we can edit this and make it our own. And that's what we really want to do, but make an offer, execute contract. I really like at home insurance they'll, uh, or at home inspection, home insurance, home warranty and close. So I like how we can come down here and hit add step. We can add a title to the card. Uh, for example, meeting with client. I have a question. How does yeah. the consumer, your seller or your buyer get this thing? So they can, on the right hand side of the, if we go to your website, so I'm just going to pull up this sample website right now. If you are signed in or logged in to your website and you hit this drop down, you'll have a little section that will say guide. I will pop up right underneath home. Then uh, if you want to download your application and you're trying to get those links, if you come over here to site and app settings, we can click on here and we can jump over to URLs. Under URLs, you can see here, this is my subdomain and I can change this. So if you wanted to change, if you've, uh, got onboarded and then you wanted to come in here and change your subdomain, you can definitely do that uh, right here. And then right here is, this is where you'll get your app URL. All right, app and that's, URL. so you get that, you get that URL thing, and then what do you do with it? And then you share it with your friends and your, your sphere. Uh, okay, but cool. my favorite way to share the app is actually uh, to utilize a smart plan if we jump under smart plans here and we go to, uh, just let me just search. All right. So, yeah. Well, he's there. But that's how you do it. That's how you find the guide. Uh, I'm going to leave this guide up and then would Deb or Deb, would you like to talk more about the process a little bit? Well, you know, a little bit, we're on the contract to close, uh, you know, um, program here. I, I think this is cool and it's getting deep and I want 
to, to you know everybody in their market center has a tech trainer you know and Perfect. i would absolutely after class run right down and you know and, and say hey help me with this i learned this thing and i really want i think help me set it up help me get this thing done and because again like everything we do it, it you really want to know how to do it really well and um you know, so that we can just, you know, we want to get through our thing here. But I, I love that whole piece in there. Also, there's just a PDF, good old buyer guide, like, you know, and seller guides. But the app is is the way to go. Right. And so um, I that would be my so, suggestion. Not so to cut getting you off. back on 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 to the to contract to close the class. What's the next step? Uh, would would right. you like to share so, your screen or? Yeah, let me go back to screen share. See if I w w even have the thing anymore. Here it is, right here. I've right, got cool. it. We're going. So we're talking sellers now. Sellers timeline. Now we're at, yeah. Now we're going to build the sellers timeline. You're going to get your app all looking good. But at the end of the day, we are the ones. We're the GCs here. We have to manage everybody. So what? What? You're right, Mike. So they get their offer. Yeah. Then what's? What do we do next? Seller Ooh. people. Who's got to, who knows what the sellers need to do in our timeline? Let's look at the timeline. So we got the accepted offer. Anybody else? Move. <laughs> the next Move. day? <laughs> clean, out their, clean out their house. <laughs> so they've got their offer. Hmm, who's the I first mean, person sure they, they need to talk to? Hmm? They need to get ready for the inspection, right? I mean, they need yeah, to be prepared ahead. for the inspection. Make sure that they're preparing their house for the inspection. Um, and essentially, I mean, Jacqueline might be a little on the right, right here. They need to start packing. I mean, need to get ready to pack. The big ones, though, are inspection. Be prepared for inspection. And then when the inspection report comes back, be prepared to negotiate again. Yes. Yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Anything on this? The sellers have a lot less to do. Um, you know, the appraisal is going to come in and then closing. So we got no other comments on this. Okay. We can just move on to the next. One of the pitfalls too, I want you to, to encourage you guys all to know it, it to not do, which happens a lot when you're a new agent. When you get that accepted offer, um, you know, you're under contract, you're congratulating the buyers and the sellers, and it's all exciting and all that. The worst thing that you can do as a real estate agent is calculate your commission. It's the worst thing you can do. Never, never do that until you close, because this is what we're talking about. The pitfalls of of this for our buyers and sellers is it's gonna, it potentially has the potential to fall apart, right? And so what happens when it fall apart, falls apart? You lose that opportunity to make that money. So the next step is what we're gonna talk about next. If we can go to the next screen, Deb, we're talking about relationships. Sam, can did I you have say one thing really lunch? quick? Yes. That, um, that nobody um, mentioned when I took it, um, the Ignite thing, but I, I learned as I went. But um, in command, you um, you know, you, with the opportunities, every yeah. step along the way, you're putting in all of those documents, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's like, yeah, I, I don't know. I was like halfway through my my um, transaction, and they're like, "Well, it's all in there, right?" I'm like, "What? No, what are you talking about?" So. Yeah, I think that's just like important. I didn't, I don't know if you guys went over it like earlier. So one but... of the things you should do is, is what Deb just suggested is spend some time with your tech trainer. Mm -hmm. Each, each market center is a little different in terms of how they operate the, um, essentially it's compliance, Jacqueline. I mean, it's, it's all yeah. about compliance, about getting, making sure that we're tracking the documents and they all need to go into command, but every state is different in terms of what is and isn't required. Okay, so yeah. that is an important thing. You should sit with your tech trainer, go through that, what documents you need to get into the system. Sam, you had something else you wanted yep. to say. Um, well, I, I'm looking at these things and saying, okay, you're telling the, you know, you're saying the seller is going to then prep for the inspection and then prep for the appraisal and stuff like that. Um, if it's my listing, I've already leaned into that. We've already, we've already had that discussion. We're hopefully already taking care of those things. and even in just listing the property and having the initial conversations saying, okay, don't forget, there's going to be an inspection, there's going to be an appraisal. And if there are things that we need to, um, you know, clean up or, or address or look at 
or at least be knowledgeable of. Um, That might be stuff that we want to reveal during the listing. Um, Don't let people find stuff to then come back to you and beat you up on the price. You know, if you put right in your listing, hey, uh, you know, probably needs a new roof on this portion. Or if, uh, you know, something is seeing a certain amount of age, then you can you can turn around and say to the um, say to the buyer, yes, that's why it's priced as it is, and and we've taken that into account, and I appreciate you pointing it out, but we know that, and we're we're that's why we're where we're at. Huge, huge um, thing, Sam. I mean, when you're that that goes to um, you know when you're in the listing appointment talking about these kind of things, that's really really great point. However, one thing that you should know is is that not, not all of us are qualified to be home inspectors, right? So, um, you know, if you're going through a home and you don't know, you know, whether, a, a, you know, the, whether the kitchen is GFCI protected in terms of the outlets and all that kind of stuff, you don't want to go down that road. But point well taken, you are going to have a, uh, you know, a home inspection. So be prepared for that. Um, there are some people, too, actually, that will go out and actually get a pre-home inspection for their listing, um, which they can provide. And it's an option um, if you want to, if your client's willing to spend the money. You can also suggest to your clients if there are some issues, uh, for sure, clean your furnace, have that done. Um, maybe hire an electrician to come through and go through the house, make sure all the co- the faces to the you know the 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 uh, electrical boxes are all covered. Um, those are big ones, red flags. Make sure the GF GFCIs are all done correctly in in unfinished basement spaces or in bathrooms or you know wherever water is. Those kind of things are great when you're doing the listing. So that's a great point. Thank you very right, much. And right. And, and just so, from a from either either end of it, when you go to look at a house or you go to show a house, um, people walking through and seeing those little details that aren't taken care of makes them wonder about what other hidden things weren't yeah, taken yeah, care absolutely. of. If you can present absolutely. well, it makes them more confident. All right. So the next step here, the next phase is talking about communication. Communication and who do you communicate with? Am I on the right slide? Best practice for managing the deal or where are you at? I think that you're back, you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me by one. So we're talking about relationships, plot a communication plan. So this goes along with your timeline. Who do you contact? Who do you reach out to? Um, what is a relationship? What's, what's the importance of a relationship? Who are the most important people in our sphere that we should have good, solid, strong relationships with? Anybody? Yeah, let's hear some, here's some, what do we got? New, write it new down. voices, right, Deb? You want to hear some new voices? Yeah, yeah. What? Who else, who are your a vendor affiliates that you need the minute you either have a buyer or, you know, who, who do we need to know? Who's who? Mr. Newcomb, what do you got for us? I know our um, fire inspections are running behind, so I'm, I'm going to want to make sure that we've got our, our smoke inspection scheduled right away. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to be we're not going to be able to close <laughs> and i'm also going to want to double check how they want to be paid because red island's kind of quirky sometimes they want to check sometimes they only want cash which is crazy mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. sometimes they need a, a credit card paid in advance so who, uh, who, who's the person that we need to do who who's who who's that person that helps us with that piece benjamin uh, typically in rhode island uh the seller or the seller's agent will go ahead and, and get a hold of uh, the fire department okay the seller. All right. And on that depo- on that um, money thing is who handles that part of the closing? Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, uh, if the seller has vacated the home at this point, they've left a check. Uh, I have learned to keep a checkbook in the car. <laughs> oh, oh, we're talking about the smoke thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about smoke, fire, fire safety yeah. inspections. Yeah, I always yeah. have a checkbook with you. What other people in, in, associates do we need during the contract to close who we've talked about it already a little bit let's let's get a list going we know we need a home inspector two or three of them the first name basis that's key by the way having a first name basis is so so important put your home inspectors on your christmas card list and send them a christmas card <laughs> they're on your contacts in your database right they should be. if they aren't they should be right how Who about, else? Um, what else? How about utility readings, like your water and, you know, yeah. the transfer of your utilities? So who does that, Stacey, do you think? Who, who, do, who do you call? I 
don't know, actually. <laughs> right, well, well, the utility company. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. So when one of the things like Steve, like Sam was talking about, when you go into the lit, go into set up a lister, you should talk about, you know, who is your provider, <laughs> who's your electric company, who's your oil provider, who's yeah. the, who, you know, delivers your propane. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you guys, I'm sure in your market center, there's maybe a list somewhere of those kind of questions, you know, and that's really back on the listing, you know, working with sellers class, but, you know, hopefully you will, you'll know all of that, but in general, you know, we need, we need to know home inspector contractor close. Like we've got home inspectors. We got to worry about who else might we need to call during a deal. Maybe the bank, anybody? Yeah. Gonna talk to our Lona? mortgage specialist. Who else do we need to call in the in the moment of panic? That remember, we're in charge of this deal. We 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 have to be the problem solvers. The house sells itself. We insurance. just we're the one who insurance and attorney. Yeah, attorneys. Insurance Title agent. Company. What? Title company. Title companies. Surveyor. What was that? Survey. Survey. Bank usually handles that, but it's important to know a surveyor for sure. Depends on what state you're in, though, because in Vermont, we have to call them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In, in Mass, the lender does the that. Yeah. A couple more. Yeah, we, we handle it. A couple more hmm. that we need to know in our phone during a deal. Problem solving. Simple. What's the first person you should be reaching out to? Your broker, maybe? Your broker, yeah. your team lead. Particularly if you're, I, I'm assuming everybody has some sort of a coach or mentor. I'm kind of looking for roofer. We need to, sometimes we need a roofer to go over and look at something, or we need a tree person or a flying squirrel person. <laughs> All of these, kind, I, I've had one, every, you know, everything electric, you need, and we're always talking about database. All of these people should be in your database because contract to close is when you need those guys. Sue, oh, Sue, Sue Doyle. What do you got? You got something there, Sue. I saw something. Trash companies, uh, every type of contractor. Benjamin said specialized inspectors and trades people. All right. So these Hold are it. things, these are people that we need first name basis on. We need to have great relationships with them. When you show up at a home inspection, you should know the home inspector's first name. You should ask them questions, just like we ask our clients questions. We want that whole, the Ford method, right? Family, occupation, you know, recreation, <laughs> you know, have those conversations with the contractors. You want to get to know who they are. When they show up, you want them to say to you, you know, in my particular, or in Stacy's case, you know, the home inspector jumps out of the car and says, hey, Stacy, how are you today? It was great to see you last week at that other deal. It gives your clients a level of comfort that really, really adds to your credibility. By the way, also, they become great referral networks for you really good referral networks for you. Because if you're doing a good job, if you're bringing them customers, they're going to turn around and say, if their cousin or their aunt or their uncle or their kids, whatever on that lineup, want to sell a property or buy a property, they're going to come and call Stacy Gallagher. Right. And that goes both ways job. too, for those, those people in our lives that have, uh, you know, the oh my God, I need a handrail. Is there any chance you can? And they're like, sure, no problem. We'll be over on Saturday at nine. Uh -huh. You know, when those people or anyone in your life then needs a plumber or an electrician or whatever, send them those people. It's, yeah. you know, I've had the same contractors of all different varieties in my life for over 15 years now. Um, they're friends. I repeatedly just send them money out of the blue so they don't retire. I'm kidding about that. But, um, you know, you pray, you hope and pray they don't retire because you're comfortable with them. They're comfortable with you. When a client says, do you know this person? And you can say, yes, I've used them both personally. And for over a decade, uh, my clients have had wonderful luck. 
because that's what they need. They want to know that you're just not in the phone book. I know that's aging myself, but you're not just, you're not just Googling plumber Portsmouth, New Hampshire and and sending them 10 names. Who knows? So So one of the most important things that Sue is talking about is building these relationships because what you become as the realtor is sort of the conduit for all these things. So the first person, if somebody moves into your neighborhood and you sell them a home, they're your, they're, they're your neighborhood's first impression. You are their first impressions. Mm. So when they come to a neighborhood, so if they need something done at their house, if they need their gutters cleaned, who do you think they're going to call? They're not going to call the dentist. They're going to mm. call you. If they need their driveway repaired, if they need a tree service guy, they're going to call you. So make sure as a new realtor, call these people, go to your home inspector's offices, meet them, give them their business card, tell them about you, ask them to tell them about, you know, have them tell you about them. Yep. Um, they're super, super important. And this is a reality. We're going to take a break here in about two or three minutes. Yeah, I was I just, just wanna, saying we probably need a little break. Yeah, I just want to give you a little story about how how you literally become the conduit of what happens in your community. Um, and I have seen this in my own life where people call me for all different kinds of things. But the oddest one I ever had was in the town of Stowe, we had a fire in a house one day. And uh, I had become established about three or four years in the business. And um, all of a sudden people started calling me, emailing me and texting me asking what happened. And I thought to myself, like, I don't even live in that neighborhood. What are they calling me for? But then what I realized was I am the person that people reach out to. I'm the person that they want to call for information that's going on in the neighborhood. If they, if they have any issues or questions about, you know, what's going on in the, on the weekend or what the event is coming up or whatever it might be, people reach out to you as the realtor. So build those relationships. It's super, super important. The other major relationship that you need to have, and it's often difficult, and we're going to break here at 1030, I promise. Um, is the relationship with the other brokers and other agents in your community. It's huge. It's a huge, huge part of this business that we all need to work together. Um, If you don't have good relationships with the other agents, bringing a contract from contract to close sometimes becomes adversarial. You don't want that. You want a good relationship with your other brokers so that you can bring this to a smooth close. Any questions on that? Any? I find it to be super important in my career and in my business. I want good relationships with the other brokers in my marketplace um, so that we can have good closes. And it doesn't always work, by the way. There are some people that just think that this needs to be adversarial. And I don't believe so. I believe that they have a buyer or a seller. I have the opposite. We should come together and collaborate to get to the end goal, which is to close the house. All right, cool. So what's our timeline for break? What do you think, Deb? It's 10.30. I've been babbling on and we've been babbling on for an hour and a half. I was going to say 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, why don't we meet back at 20 of 11? We've got still more to go. Everybody cool with that? Get a water, take a break. All right. Thanks, everybody. Give us 10 minutes. We'll see ya.
Hey, Mike. How are you, Deb? Ready Good. to go? I just want to make sure that I'm on the right slide. We are it's getting mixed uh, up a little. So we're doing no, best we're good, practices. We're good, we're good. Best practices for managing the deal. That slide or the next is fine, I think. Okay. So best practices. Um, what do you? Avoidance. Yeah. And then your co broke, then get repeat business. Uh, checklist. Consumer guide that we did a little already. Okay. Sounds like if you guys speak really quickly, we'll be done in the next three hours. Yeah, no, we gotta. We don't have a lot of time left for the rest of the program. Sam, this is all my fault. I take full responsibility because I'm the new guy. I've only held this role since December 16th. So nice. Do How do you like first, it? This is the first class I've ever done on this sort of level. I've done smaller ones from my market center, but mm -hmm. first one to do the big scale like this. So it's hard too because you're not in front of people. You can't draw on the board. I know you can, but I don't know how to do it. You know, on Zoom, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, and you're speaking to people in other states, which makes it a little tricky. But it, you know, it's very very good to have, you know the you know interaction with everybody and as we all know there's no two deals that are exactly alike but there are certainly rhythms that we must follow and there's landmines that you always hit and sometimes everything is just gravy so as we move forward we'll be talking a little bit you know sort of more about some of those um little bit of landmines and talking about working with your co-brokes and you know <clears throat> some of the things that come up just so that you're prepared and you're not blindsided you know yeah i jumped around a whole lot going from all different kinds of things but that's just my style so yeah that's good we're good we'll see let's see how many people do we get and let me know if you want to do another breakout room or no i think it would be cool if people could put their video cameras on i know some people are shy maybe still some, in their pajamas, some of the trainers know. um remove them if their face isn't on yeah yeah, yeah. i'm it's new remember huh? <laughs> i'm new remember i don't want to you know i mean some people can't and they have another job and i understand yeah, that yeah yeah what that means stacy that was a beautiful dog you had there what kind of dog is that i know i love he, people. he's an english golden come here an English oh, golden. Yeah, come English here. golden. Come here. English typically means they're a little stockier, a little bigger head. Oh, yeah. oh, so cute. He's actually um, only <coughs> six months old, too. <laughs> He's going to awesome. be a big boy. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay. I have okay. an English black lab. Uh, okay. Handsome, handsome, yeah. handsome. Okay, all right. now that we're uh, all back, uh, if you have the ability to turn your camera on, love it. It would be awesome if you could. Um, helpful to know who we're talking to. But if you have your, um, we're going to go right into risk management um, and talk about best practices on how to avoid risk, um, yep. you know, risk avoidance. So if you have your workbook and you want to change, turn to page five, you can yep. actually follow along here. We can ask questions and you can fill in the blanks and all that kind of stuff. So um, please, please, please tell us. Uh, Am I screen actually, sharing? You know what What's that, Deb? I just said, did I screen share? Am I screen sharing? Nope, but that's okay. All right, sorry, I got this. Unless you switch to the big screen. Okay, so for... Let's go back to who purchased who's purchased a home before. Has anyone actually gone under contract, but it did fail? Oh, good you question. You didn't act to get to close. Did anyone has anyone ever had that experience personally? Let's hope not. Uh oh, Ben, you're shaking your head. You <laughs> yes, did I'm tell shaking us. my head. <laughs> what happened, so, uh -huh. Mr. Newcomb? Uh, what do you got? A horrible, horrible inspection. Uh, my spouse is a veteran, so you can imagine uh, how that went. Uh, the seller um, 
Hold on, Ben, one second. Are, do, were you applying for a VA loan? Yes. Okay. So people that don't understand that, I'm just going to give them a little backstory, Ben, so that people know what, what you're talking about. For a VA loan, not only do you need a regular traditional home inspection, but the appraiser is a home inspector as well. And VA has certain appraisers that are only allowed to appraise VA loans. In the state of Vermont, believe it or not, we're a small state, by the way, we only have two VA certified appraisers in the entire state. There's only two of them. Um, so not only do you have to be conscientious of the fact that the VA loan and the appraiser is going to come out and be very, very detailed, but you also have to make sure the timeline is correct because it's difficult, especially in a small state like Vermont, to, to actually get the appraiser because there's only two of them. So go ahead, Ben. Sorry. And what happened? Uh, oh my gosh, what didn't happen? <laughs> uh, there were issues uh, with the septic system. There were issues with wood boring insects. There were plumbing issues. There was a roofing issue. There was a, you couldn't use the chimney. Um, it, was, it was a fire hazard. Just thinking off the top of my head, um, there was some unsafe electrical issues uh, in the laundry area. Um, there was some contamination in the well water. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, big long story short, the seller completely freaked out. Uh, there, there was a huge fight in between um, both parties with the agents and the deal just completely fell apart. And ultimately uh, it went off the market and uh, they just decided not to sell. Hey Ben, were you a real estate agent at the time? Uh, I was not, but it's part of the reason I got into it. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> do, you awesome. think, do you think the, the listing agent should have maybe had a little heads up that his property might be a challenge for a VA appraiser, FHA appraiser, or, do, or did they just not know either? Uh, I think one of the biggest problems is they just weren't even showing up most of the time. Yeah. Oof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not good. Not good. They weren't committed. I don't All think right. so that's committed. certainly a roadblock. I think the agent was committed. I think both both of those parties there um, were weren't really committed, and and you know. Those were some red flags for sure. <laughs> Maybe yeah, even sirens work. looking back on it, but yeah. Well, and that's that's to the point of this discussion. Where is the deal at risk of falling apart? What are the best practices to keep the deal alive? You lived through it, unfortunately, but now as an agent, how can you be proactive in your world? You know, that list, you know, you know that sounds like a big fat bummer but it probably could have been avoided, you know, a, Listen, a little what, bit. Ben, what are the things that you would have done that, that they failed to do? Yeah. Right out of the gate, when the agent went to look through the property, they should have been pointing out some of the big whammies that were, you know, glaringly obvious. Um, yeah. It turned out later on in some communication uh, with a neighbor that you know the seller was aware of most of these issues yeah uh, going into the listing um they knew that they were going to have to recase the well for example um they knew that they had some issues with carbon durants and some termites and everything so uh the discovery process alone should have been hey these things are going to come up <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. when you see that we're financing um, with, 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 a, with a tricky approach. <laughs> yeah, it might have been somebody who really didn't, wasn't trained, Agreed. you know, or didn't learn, didn't really understand. I mean, if it's, you just don't know until you know, until you're in the middle of it. So, um, this is yeah. a, This is a huge learning though for all of us. So one of the things that you have to understand too, both as a listing agent as a buy, and a buyer's agent, if you're working with a, a VA loan, right? I believe that we need to provide the best for our veterans, right? And that's one of the reasons why the VA has specific appraisers, because we want the best for our veterans. However, there are some agents on the listing side that don't want to work with VA loans. Don't be that person. Right. It's discriminatory. Uh, and Pink is, has a, when you're finished, has a question. Well, I was going to ask uh, May, actually, uh, but Pink, if you have a question, let's ask the question. But May also had a, same, a similar experience to Ben. Oh, good, good. Experience. So, Pink, what do you have? Mr. Gupta. Yeah, so my question is, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Had a question before me. Mr. Gupta, you go ahead. What's your question? 
my huh? question is how would the seller if suppose seller is innocent and he doesn't know anything about all those things or he doesn't know how to figure those problems out as a seller agent or should you recommend to do like a a, a little bit check up of the home for the VA loans kind of things uh, so like what like should what, be a process uh, yeah like what sam said earlier when you're taking a listing you might want to take go through the house and do an ex a discovery sort of uh, inspection for yourself. You can go through the house and see if you can find some of the, the issues. Some of them are glaring, right? Like if there's no handrails, if there's yeah. no railing around a deck, if, uh, you know, if they have uh, face covers missing from electrical plates, if the electrical box is all rusted out. I mean, there's some big glaring ones. If it's a complicated one and you don't feel like you're qualified, you can suggest a couple of different things. One is you can suggest to have to have them get a pre-listing home inspection. It's not always done, um, but it is an option. It's one option. The other option is, is to ask them to hire or bring in a plumber, um, a contractor, and an electrician to go through the house and do some sort of repairs that would help with that, you know, kind of fix up those glaring issues. Sue, did you have another question? Sue Doyle? Mine is goes... May, because I want to hear about May's story. Go ahead, Sue. Uh, mine is VA, and I will keep it short because if anyone in my market center is on here, which I'm sure they are, they're going to be like, oh, God, somebody woke up the devil with, with uh -huh. VA topics with <laughs> Sue. It's a huge, huge thing for me to support VA. And my, I'll keep it simple by just saying, please don't be one of those agents that repeats sure. something you've heard from somebody else along the way about the fact that they're horrible loan products. They are not. Go do your clients and the industry a favor and just go to your favorite lender and ask for, bring a cup of coffee and in 10 minutes, learn the basic parameters. Um, our office recently with our amazing in-house lender, Brad Kelly at Annie Mac Mortgage. Um, I walked into his office after hearing that at a open house or showing or whatever. And I said, Brad, is there any chance we could do like even a half hour class on kind of dispelling the rumors? And he was like, sure, no problem, got it. And we, he did this amazing class. It was very casual. Just take the time to learn it and don't drag old information that's always been wrong into this story. And now I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, Sue, I'm so thankful that you said that. And like I said, don't be that lister, that listing agent, or even the buyer's agent. Um, we want to have, and you're correct, they are great products. We want to do what's <laughs> best for our veterans. At least that's my opinion. Um, okay, May, you said that you had an issue with your property, with a property that you were going to purchase. You want to share? Yes, so I was representing both party. Oh. I was the agent, but uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't buying it. Uh, it was just uh, fell due because the inspection. <laughs> it yep. was it was a tough one because um that was the best um uh, in inspection company in the town, and um at first the the house was great because uh, the roof is new the driveway is new and new renovated so when the inspection um inspection guy went there they explained it you know there must be a small issue but the 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 buyer take it personally say oh um this could be an issue what could be an issue but it just the suggestion tell them oh what need to be keep an eye on and fix this down to the row uh, mm -hmm. after we done it it was great it was uh it was one big issue but um other than that it's just small issue but uh ending up when they see the inspection report everything is um they rated by a b c d yeah <laughs> Most of the point is was it was D. The, uh, they suggest you know have somebody to take a look, have a contractor take a look. And that time it was um, snowing. It's no water leaking or um, no water in the basement. But they say it could be happen. 
and the buyers keep asking, oh, if we fix the, we put a sub pump, um, it said we'll make a hundred percent work. I say, I cannot promise this. Right. So, right. so we're talking about risk avoidance. How do we prepare a buyer for the home inspection to do, do, you know, so that they- What do you are, say, right? What do you say to the buyer, right? Yes, I feel like- um, I Before well, the inspection. Yeah, no, I was because um, it was a tough um, situation because we I was doing an off market, the seller oh. doesn't want to put on market, so we don't have other competitive. So yeah. and I, I representing both party, I um we didn't do um we only um contingency three, three stuff. One is um the termite foundation, and the other one I think is the wall. Uh, that that was no issue, but then uh, the only thing is the foundation. Uh, they see some crack, but I honestly I didn't see any crack. But if there's a crack, I think it's fixable. But um, yeah. the inspection, <clears throat> you know, they have to say everything and they look at every detail. Yeah. Right? So let's talk about that for a second. So if you're working with a buyer, right? Let's May's situation is very very unique because she was representing both sides. Um, by the way, just so some of you know. Uh, in some states, you can't even represent both sides. It's against the law yeah. in certain states. Vermont, it's one of them. You can't actually represent both sides. You can do the deal for both sides, but you only represent one's fiduciary responsibilities. So the way that you would deal with this, right? So if you're working with a buyer, what you want to do is, is you want to prepare the buyer for the home inspection, especially when the home inspection shows up in their inbox. What mm -hmm. I always tell people is no matter what the house is, no matter how old it is, how new it is, whatever the condition it is, the home inspector is going to show up with an 80 to 120 page report. And you can't panic over it. You have to understand that it's his job to find out all the details of the house and everything that's wrong with the house. That's what we're paying the home inspector to do. And I believe that what we should be telling our buyers is, this isn't for you to go in and renegotiate or to panic and think that you need to get rid of the deal. What it's for is, is to help you understand what you're purchasing so that you know what's going on in the house before you actually make a decision to buy it. So prepare them for, by the way, you can even have a brand new home. And I recommend this, by the way, if you have a new home, if you're purchasing a new brand new home that's being built for those buyers, you should do a home inspection because there might be something that the contractor misses, forgets to hook up and the home, the home inspection report is gonna be 80 pages long, I promise you, because that's their job. And we don't want a buyer to get it and to all of a sudden end up in panic mode and say, all these things are wrong with this house. Yes, there are things wrong with this house. However, are they solvable and you know things that we can overcome? Deb, you had something to add to that though, didn't you? Uh, no, I, yeah, I was just, that's exactly what I was gonna say. You have to prep the buyer and say, look at home inspectors, you've fallen in love with the house. The home inspector kind of you know, crushes your dreams a little bit. So be prepared, <laughs> you're gonna get, you're gonna feel weird you're going to go oh because they start poking with a you know three foot thing at everything and you're going to feel like oh my god and just know that that's normal that's how everybody feels and that's what home inspectors do so when these things go down and you're going to get a report that is going to look very scathing and typically that is from the home inspector wanting to make sure that they're covering their own self and recommending that all these things need to be checked because they don't want to get sued either. So pre preparing a buyer is really important for that home inspection so that they, when they're walking around and they feel weird, they go, oh, she said that, that was gonna, we're going to feel this way. And it, and it takes some of the sting out of what they're saying. So that's all for, for, for yeah. May, you know, so going forward, hopefully she'll, you know, that's, you know, you learn from these horrible deals, right? Absolutely, and, um, absolutely. So um, I think Sue and uh, and Mr. Gupta actually have their hands up from before. Okay, Unless yep. you have something else to add? Uh, yes. So <clears throat> this is I'm just telling my experience what happened. Yes. And uh, I need the guidance like how I could avoid that situation. So what happened? Uh, <clears throat> the basement was finished, but there was no permit for the basement finished. Mm -hmm. And buyer 
and it was like just like few of the ball, walls were there and he put like few lights over there and, uh, and those kind of things bio got panicked and say hey the town will come and tear it apart because there was no uh, permit pulled up is that a true situation or that just a fear how do i convince bio about that that this is not that big of a risk 90% people do that okay so this where this is where it comes into regional knowledge right where you are regionally so where where are you regionally what state uh, is so a state is Massachusetts. Okay, and, Massachusetts. Uh, so you'll have a little different. I might lean on Deb for this one a little bit, but I'll tell you what would happen in Vermont. And it's probably fairly similar to what would happen in Massachusetts. First off, no one from the town is going to come and tear the house apart. They're not going to come and unfinish the finished basement. They just don't have the staffing to do that, nor are they in the contracting business to do that. However, um, in the state of Vermont, what we would do is, is just reapply for a permit. And depending on which town it is, believe it or not, there's a lot of towns in, Mass in Vermont that don't have zoning. We don't have zoning regulations. We don't have building oh inspectors. Gosh. It doesn't exist. The cities do. Burlington, Montpelier, <clears throat> Rutland, the big cities have inspectors. So, um, but the small ones don't. We don't, you know, like my town, we don't have zoning regulations like what you think of zoning regulations down in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and all that. So it, for me, we would just reapply for a permit if it was even needed, because in some towns it wouldn't even be needed to have a permit. So we'd reapply for the permit to make sure it's done. They might have to have um, the zoning administrator from our town come and take a look at it. She would actually come out, take a physical look at it. If it's in a condition that she's acceptable with, on you'd go. I'm assuming in Massachusetts, it might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Deb? Yeah, the pro yeah, in, problem in, with that is, the problem with that is like the, the town takes time. And yep, it they does, could, correct. They can, they, can, they can easily kill two or three months. So that means if we are asking for that, that means either we are postponing the closing to two or three months later, yeah. which seller will not agree, or it is falling apart. So the thing is, how do I avoid that situation, putting myself into that situation saying, hey, this is normal or what, what, are, what are the real words? One of the things that you can do, one of the things that you can do, actually, if you're on the lister side, let's talk about the lister side. If you're on the lister side, you could go in and see if there is permits for everything, for the work that's been done. If they have a finished basement, they had to have had it done at some point. Typically, they're not done um, at the beginning when a house is built. So if you're on the listing side, you can go in and look for permits. In my case, it's a lot easier for me to do it locally than it is down in the Massachusetts area. But I want to hear what Deb has to say about what the solution would be if you actually got to contract and through the discovery phase, you ended up finding out that there was no permit for the refinishing for that beautiful bar they have in that basement. Yeah, it's a difficult, it's it's a difficult problem. And you know. Uh, sounds like Vermont is very lenient. Massachusetts, as we know, is not. Um, and yeah, typically in the real world, they're never going to make somebody rip uh, their basement apart. Um, but certainly we can't get a sign off from a home from the building inspector because they don't know what's behind the walls and who did the electrical work. So it's a very, very tricky area. I would speak to uh, your broker on that one and get some you know, sort of advice as to um, legally what you want to do, because you start calling the building department, you, you don't want to open any can of worms. A list agent is not, you know, if they're disclosing that there's no permit, that's what they've disclosed. And the buyer has, you know, so it's a tricky one. And it's really a case by case basis. Um, you know, the towns want people to pull permits because they want the property to be safe. People don't want to because they don't want to, A, pay the fee, or B, get reassessed for more square foot. But then, of course, they want to sell it, you know, <clears throat> with more square feet. So I would, I would, you know, look at locally, talk to the broker of record at your market center and just, you know, get some advice on how to handle that. It's, it's a common, common, common problem. There's more not permitted things than permitted things, typically. So it's something we deal with all the time. And, and it's Deb, hard to... Yeah, I think you're right, Deb. It's each situation is going to be unique too, based on the yeah. area of what towns they're in, 
what your yeah. relationship is with the town and hopefully your broker has an answer for you. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like Sue had a question and then we've got a couple of uh, more questions for you guys. Sue, go ahead. Just a little perspective for the live free or die state, which everyone assumes we get away with doing whatever we want. Uh, we do have some towns and uh, that will take the sheep rock apart, you know, in conjunction with the ah, cellar. Yeah. So it's been, it's been done. Um, it's yeah. not, a, I don't think it's an everyday thing, but it has certainly been done and they retain the right to do so. Yeah. Um, so it, we're, we're very much on a talk to the broker. And the other yeah. part of that is the whole ethical requirement about know where you're selling, you know, in theory know what that town's all about and what their patterns are and know the building inspectors and things like that is a huge help. I can't believe that someone would actually come in and take the, but you are right. They retain the they right have the to right. do that. Yeah, yeah. They can disassemble a deck. They can do all kinds of stuff. The towns have the right to do it. If you didn't One of our permit. smallest towns that you guys probably haven't even heard of is rather famous for it. They, I think they enjoy it. Well, <laughs> some do. Some people get very power, power hungry and all that stuff. And that that's, you know, these are things though, when we're talking about best practices and risk avoidance, you know, knowing what you're doing and what you're dealing with is very, very important. So you've so, got, you know, you always have to be aware of the things that are going to, you know, trip you up you know, home inspection issues, um, you know, and, and we have deadlines for things that have to be done and so on and so forth. So go on. Sorry. So I think we've, got, I think we've actually gone through um, where is the deal at risk uh, of falling apart. So what are the best practices? We've talked about this a little bit, but I'd love people to share what they think some of the best practices to keep a deal alive is. We already talked about one, which is preparing the the buyer for home inspection, where else yeah. can we get ahead? Uh, communication is key. Very, Huge. Very, very much. Just making sure that everyone in the process is kept up on what's happening in the process. That has yep. to be kept up on. Yep. So we also talked about another big one. Anyone else have anything else besides communication? Could it be good relationships? Yep. Make sure you have good relationships. Any, anything else that we might have that, who could we have good relationships with that would keep these from going sideways? Ben, I, I cut you off. You had something, you unmuted yourself, Mr. Newcomb, Ben Newcomb. You unmuted yourself and then muted when I kept talking. Oh, um I was just going to say, being very aware of deadlines. Um, I've yeah. seen a couple of transactions fall apart because let's say the inspection didn't go well. You weren't paying attention to your inspection period. Your inspection period lapses. You decide you're going to send over a repair addendum. Oops. Well, yeah. guess what? We dropped the ball, didn't we? Yep. Too late. It's going to be on your calendar It's because nobody's going to remember that but you. Yeah, so Ben, what are some of the ways to avoid that? How do you actually avoid having that happen? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm an 80s child, so I have this big dry erase board, which you can't see behind my big IMAX. So important dates are just always going on there because right. I need to see it every cool. day. I need to see it. Whether yeah. it's your Fantastic. fridge, by your coffee maker, a post-it note on the mirror. Whatever. On your phone, in command. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So for Everybody. sure, there's one... There, there's one big one that we all should be using is, especially if we've gone through the setup of the command is Gmail in your Gmail calendar, because it's going to give you notifications and you can set those notifications to give you reminders and it'll ding right on your phone. Um, so we, we set them up as in our calendar for calendar notifications. Um, my broker that I was originally trained under, under a small boutique uh, realtor here in town in Stowe, she used to make us do like literal sheets of paper with all the dates on them and hang them on our wall next to our desk so that we knew all the deadlines. So you just put it into a spreadsheet and print it all out and have it right there. Similar to what Ben did on his whiteboard, but um, Google Calendar is probably the best if you use Outlook, Outlook works as well. Um, what else we got? So who, uh, I'm gonna ask Stacy. I'm gonna pick on her because she showed off her dog. Who should we have good relationship with Stacy? To, uh, to make sure that the deal doesn't fall apart. Giving her a hint. 
<laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I didn't see it. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, you know, anybody in the transaction, I mean, as far as, you know, having a good relationship with the lender so that they contact you. Um, I actually just spoke with a lender um, the other day who said that there's an app that you can track all of the um, steps that you're going through in the process and it will give you just like updates. So I thought that was great. Instead of driving each other nuts and crazy, she's like, if you download this app, I can just ding you with updates um, to keep you in the loop. So I think a good relationship with your lender, um, a good relationship with your co-broke. I did see the slide. <laughs> but but um, yeah, because you're going to run into these people on other transactions. And you know, you're on the opposite side, but you guys have the same goal. And, you know... I think that's really important. It really, really, really does start with your a really good relationship with the co-broke. And we talked about this the other day, whatever class it was, negotiating the deal. You know, it has to be a win-win. The seller wants to sell the house. Buyer wants to buy it. Other agent, want, everybody wants the same thing. So the better communicating, as Ben said, um, yeah, you're, why, why, why else is the relationship with the co-broke important? Thoughts? Anybody. So did you put your hand up again? Or was it up from before? I think it's up from before. Me too. I mean, somebody the other day in one of the classes for Ignite said that um, it's kind of really important to show a little bit of grace with your co-broke because, you know, you're going to be on both sides of that transaction and you're going to hit customers along the way that are going to yank your chain and give you a hard time. And, you know, like I said, you're going to be working it with these people going forward. And just to kind of have a little bit of um, kind of perspective on um, what they're kind of going through to, and just to give them a little bit of grace. Yep. That's Absolutely. great. I mean, I also love the fact that if you, if you have a good relationship with a co-broke, right, and there's a multiple offer situation and, you know, you're in a competitive bid situation, you call up the, the other agent on the list or side, and you've worked with them before, and you've had a good dealing with them before. Um, they're gonna, they're gonna let their seller know that you know Stacy's great to work with. Um, she's gonna be very reasonable. We're, we have a good working relationship. It gives their sellers a little bit of comfort, and uh, knowing that you have a good relationship with not only that that agent but all the agents. You really want to have good relationships with everybody. It's hard though, because like I said before, some people want to make it out of a cereal um, and it's, it's not fun when it gets to that point. So uh, anything else? Want, well, you want to make sure too, that you have a good relationship and you have a good sense of this other agent as to how things are going to go. Are they going to stay on focus and know their own timelines? Are they going to get things done? Are they going to, are, do they have good people in their systems so that you're not scrambling around and doing everything? So having a good relationship also helps you understand the, the level of um, competence that the other agent has, you know, or however you want to say it. So that, you know, if, the, if you've worked with them before and they're great and it's all good, you just know, all right, we've, we've got this. But uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a very important uh, relationship. It's one of the first ones, you know, of course. So, you so know. One of the other things that um, as we're going through this, you, you know, setting expectations when May was telling us her story, we talked about setting expectations for the buyer. We should also set expectations about costs of things. So when you're working with a buyer, you want to make sure that the buyer understands that, you know, if they put an offer in on a house of whatever it might be, $250,000, they have to recognize that they're going to have some additional costs. And if we don't lay that out right in front, you're going to end up with a problem, right? So if you don't let, you got to make sure that the, um, that the buyer knows that they're going to be responsible for a home inspection, the cost of a home inspection. If, if you're in my marketplace, the buyers don't pay for septic pumping, but if they want to have it inspected and the line scope, they have to pay for that. They're going to have to pay an attorney's fee, you know, to make sure that, you know, and that can go anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000. So make sure you set those expectations up, at, up front. The last thing you want to do is end up having an executed contract and then thinking that, you know, the 
whatever, throw a number out there, the $250,000 tiny home that they're buying um, is, is all the money that they're going to spend. They need to be prepared that there will be some other costs because that could literally torpedo a deal for you. Sam, you had a comment? Uh, yes, it was to the previous point of, of having a good relationship with your co-broker. Um, prior to coming into this business, I did not understand. I thought that we were competing with and against um, other brokers for listings and sales and all that. And you really have to get beyond that mindset because we're all we're all working to make this a living. And if you can establish good relationships, you're all going to get a cut of it. You know, if you're at all competent, hopefully, um, you're going to get a chance to buy and sell, and you're going to if you're going to need their assistance and it's just not, it's not worth looking at the other brokers as um, competitors. Absolutely, right. Sam. It's a great point. And you know what else you can follow up with that? You also can get referral business from your other, um, right. from the other agents in your market. If, if someone comes to their listing, right, if they're the listing agent and someone comes to as a buyer and they say, the, the buyer says, I want representation. I want to be represented. You, you Yes, you can refer to someone in your office. If they turn to you and say, they turn to that person and say, I don't want someone in your office. I want someone else. Well, you know, hey, I know Sam Co. He's been great. I've worked with Sam for a long time. He's done plenty of deals together with me. That's why you want to make sure you have a good relationship with them because it could end up coming back to you with some referral business. All right. Any questions? As we're kind of moving along. I think we've gone through most of those original questions. What yeah. happens with missed deadlines? I think Ben covered that for us. Thank you, Ben. Um, strategies on how to uh, dealing with vendors and other parties that have a slow response. Uh, speaking of slow responses, one of the things I always tell my buyers when they're applying for a mortgage, make sure every single Monday morning you send an email or pick up the phone and call the lender. Make sure every single Monday from the moment you sign the contract until they get the clear to close, call that lender every single Monday or send them an email and ask, am I missing anything? Do you need anything from me? Are any of my timed out deadlines coming up? This is a message that your buyer wants to send to your lender, wants to send to their lender. Because there are deadlines that are attached, by the way, to some of the things that the lender has that we might not even know about. You know, when did they apply for their credit? Their credit might run out. So there might be a deadline. So this is a way to not have that happen. Constantly stay in contact or I should say, have your buyer constantly stay in contact with the lender. So we make sure that we don't have a pitfall as we're moving along. All right. right. And just one thing that this slide is, is interesting um, right in the middle here uh, or almost toward the end where, you know, we want to always get repeat business and referrals. You know, we've, we're teaching everybody, we're going to use the KW app. We're going to create these fantastic vendor and utility list or affiliates and all everybody in our world that's going to help us out. And then obviously we're going to plan our little closing gift. The reason why this is sort of not at the end, like not the last page, is because right when you're in the middle of a deal and things are going great, the mortgage commitment is you're getting ready to close. That's when you ask for your referrals. They're hot. That's the... That's when the sellers and the buyers, when you've got it ready to close and they're starting to dream about their new house and really take, let their guard down and think, okay, this thing's going to happen. We're really going to move. And that's the time that you want to sort of say, Hey, I'm, I'm so glad I just spoke to the lender. Things are rocking and rolling. We're good. You know, I'm so happy for you guys. You know, if you know anybody who's and they go, Oh, we love you. You're so great. Say, you know, the only thing, only thing I ask is if you happen to know anybody who's looking to buy or sell or invest, I'd love their name. I'd love to help them out. Don't wait till the closing is over to ask. Ask because they're going to be all crazy busy thinking about moving. Do it now. Do it in that sweet spot. So that's why they plop that thing in here, I think. That's Again, all. Let, let's have, I want to ask some people too. What, what are some of the best that you've heard of? What are some of the best closing <clears throat> gifts? When you have a buyer and they're buying their home for the first time, what's a good closing gift? Anybody? You guys must be getting the e these emails already about closing gifts that you can customize. Ben, what do mm -hmm. you got? Uh, I, I think a really clever thing is there's usually some time. It could be overnight. could be a few hours in between your final walkthrough and a closing. 
a lot of times you're going to snap a picture for social media saying sold or just bought, whatever. Um, take that picture, go over to CVS or wherever you can, print out a nice little glossy, put it in a frame, nice little closing gift. They can put the picture up on the wall. It's not very expensive. They're that's unbelievable, record. dude. Yeah, I've never thought that. that's like, you just blew my mind with that one. That's awesome idea. Love it. <laughs> it's not very expensive if you work in. You, you can go buy it in an expensive frame and, you know, they're going to look at that. And, you know, if you remind them that you give great referral gifts too, ding, ding. <laughs> How about this one? You know, you're going to have a closing in a week on, on somebody's house. Go around, buy a nice card that says, welcome, welcome to your new home and go around the neighborhood and, and meet all the neighbors and say, hey, this, this, uh, these folks are buying, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Wilson's house, you know, they're moving on in this. I'm, would you mind writing a little welcome to the neighborhood note on the card and have everybody sign it and then put your little basket together of goodies or whatever you do and bring it over. And, and that is, I think, a very nice, A, you're meeting all the neighbors and talking about selling the house that they've been watching, you know, and now the buyer, because of course you want to adopt the buyer of your listing. And now they go, oh, look, at we got this card from all these people. Isn't that nice? I just think that's another really much, uh, just a pretty thoughtful type of uh, exercise that I picked up hearing on some other class. So I always thought that was a cool one. Yeah, that is a really, really good one. Really yeah. Good. I'm like going to implement gifts. that. Etsy gifts are personal and you also get to help a small business and the turnaround is like Absolutely. amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Cutting boards that have your family's name, if they have the same last name, if not the address of their new home, like work perfectly. And they sit on the counter, they're butcher blocks and they work perfectly. Like, and it's a constant reminder. Somebody comes over for a holiday and it's like, oh my God, I love your cutting board. I love your butcher block. Where'd you get that? And make sure you put your own name on it so you can, you can claim it as a, a marketing piece. Exactly. Anyone else? Branded. Those are great ideas. Some really, nice. really solid ideas. All right. I love the prospecting one, Deb. That's a good one. That's cool. I have, you know, I just heard on some class, some lady did it and I thought, oh my God. That's and brilliant. If, you know, if you have a, you know, of course we're a little rural, sometimes it's 20 miles, 10 miles between the next neighbor, but you know, it, it can be a great application for a particular kind of a, you know, a kind of a setting. So I, I just I thought it was pretty cool. Mine's boring. Oh. I, I thought mine was cool. I buy, I always buy new home, first time home buyers ladders, a four foot oh. ladder and a two foot ladder, because it's something that no one ever buys for themselves. Or oh, that's has. interesting. But it's a really boring one now that I've heard Ben's and I don't know. I think that's pretty and, cool. Yeah. Oh, it's they're a good all one. good. Let's say that. I put the two, hit the four foot and the two foot and my kids always said, dad, do not tell them which is his or hers <laughs> because I'd be discriminating. Okay. All right, so where are we? We're up next. We're getting so that. Can, can we go into Ben? Can you show us how to put together a checklist? Yeah, I definitely can. Dream. So within our opportunity, right. wait a minute. Let me get out. Do I have to stop or something? No, no. I'll, oh. I'll switch. It's oh there. crap! Whatever. Oops. Ben, mm -hmm. let me make you the co-host again. I think you've been room. Oh no, you're still the co-host. All right. Yep. I'm. I'm all set. Good. Jumping go. 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 In. So what are we so, going to learn? We're going to learn how to create an opportunity. So we're going to be looking at the opportunity checklist items and the oh, opportunities. So everyone knows how to create the contact and then you've created the opportunity at this point. Right now, we're going to be jumping in and hitting that KW and jumping down to at opportunities here. Opportunities is separated into listings, buyers, leases, and this shouldn't be the first time you're seeing this. Right. So you have this separated into your uh, main phases, cultivate, appointment, active, under contract, and close. Within each one of these, you can click in, and now you have every single one of your opportunities on one of these cards that you can easily click on and drag and drop over. You know what elements on your screen are able to be dragged and dropped, based off of these little six dots on that left-hand side here. So we can drag and drop any of these. And what we can do is we can drag and drop people through our list, uh, through our cultivate all the way through closed. So right now I'm going to show this example under the closed. Uh, so you can move people along your process. 
within each of your processes, you have each of your stages, you have uh, different checklist items that you can uh, create. So for example, for the join stage, I have, they are interested in working with me. And this is a little checklist that I have for each of these different stages that I have. I'm joined, I have, then I have get phone number, get email address. These are more things that I'm doing as an agent for each of these steps. And we're able to see a checklist for each and every individual or each and every opportunity has its own checklist. I want you to notice this bottom right-hand corner here. This tells you with this person or this opportunity within this stage here, I know that I have not done the five things I have to do in order to move him to my next stage in my process. So I can click on here and see those checklist items here on this left-hand side. I can also see that this one has five out of five done already checked off. So you can utilize this in order to keep track of your process all the way through. <coughs> when you're closing at different points within your process, you can set up uh, client updates. For example, if this is inspections and we say home inspection and completed and I hit save. I want you to notice the center piece here that says client update. A client update is a email that goes to your consumers or the person that the opportunity has to do with. So it, it sends them an email that shows, uh, shows them the, uh, basically that we're checking things off your list. And I'm going to attempt right now to pull that up, but bear with me one second while I do that. Uh, while I look for this on my command system, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and pull that up really quickly. Hold on. Um, Mike, while Ben's looking that up, I did you a little a text message, but I have a standing meeting that I have to get ready for, for at 1145. So you guys can take it home, but uh, I enjoyed being in class today, contract to close. That's the, that's, that's where you, that's where the bread and butter is. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, continue on and, and, um, be great. I'm sure you'll all do wonderful. And I'm glad to see, uh, I really appreciate and applaud you guys for taking the time all these days to attend Ignite. It's, you know, it's, it's a bit time consuming, but absorb, learn, put it into practice and you'll be good. All right. Yeah, I got to yeah. run. Thanks, yeah, so much, yeah, thanks guys. so much for your help today. I'll circle back. We'd love to get together with you and uh, chat for a few minutes. Yeah, all right. No worries. All right. I'll see you later, guys. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Sounds good. Bye-bye, Ben. Thank you. Later, later. So I, I found it on my screen. So I'm going to share my screen again and Great. just show you guys quickly. So this is what the client update actually looks like. It has your branding up at the top. And all it says is it puts in their name and then it says, we're checking things off the list. Here's a summary of tasks completed for, and then it will say the opportunity name. And then it will just list off the items that you have checked. So this is a really good way where every step of the process that you're going through with your clients, uh, as you go through them, you can simply go through your checklist and check off for the client to receive an update that way, they are communicated with all the way through your process. Especially, this is important at the end of the opportunity when you're dealing uh, clear to close uh, or contract to close. You want to make sure that the person is being kept aware of everything that's, that you're doing in order to help facilitate that process along. Ben, can you show us um, how uh, these are customizable, right? These checklists? 
Yes. So each is customized. Yeah, customized. Yeah. So let me go show you my screen one more time and uh, yeah, that would be important. And I'll I'll try to slow down. Please stop me if I'm going too fast. So okay, what we we're going to be fast. doing is I'm going to just start off uh, hitting the red KW, jumping down to opportunities. Then we're going to jump into either the listing section or the buying section. So for example, let's do the buying section. So for example, we'll do under contract here. I want yes, you that's to know it at right now in the process. Today's under contract, right? Great. Great. So under contracts. So then what you can see here are the different steps through the process. So under active, I'll just start with active and walk us through. So appointment, scheduling, scheduled, kept. Then under active, we have searching, showing, and negotiations. Under contract, we have escrow, inspections, appraisal. And under closed, we have closed and legacy. Also have a list view if that helps. So under each of these, what you, we have is the different stages each have a checklist item. So we can come up to the top right of your command system and hit the edit stages button. Once we hit the edit stages button, you'll notice that in the center, you'll see probability. And to the right of that, you'll see a checklist. Now, if you jump in and you click any of these items, you can edit them, add to them, or you can come over on this right-hand side here and you can select the little pencil in order to edit this field. So we can add different, we can change the stage name. If we want to edit the checklist items, we want to check, uh, click into the checklist and add the item. I do want to point out that that once you, if you do select the client update, it's going to have this exactly show up on that email, what this says here. So if I spell it home inspection and I really wanted it to be or to show up with that client email as a capital I there, I want to make sure that this title or this section of text is what I want to be shown. When it's emailed is what you're saying. When it's emailed, yes. Yeah, we wanna make sure- And the client update is optional, but how you guys can utilize this is in order to keep track of your process all the way through uh, your command system. Ben, can you also show us if they want to add a stage? How do we add a stage? So if I wanted to add in, let's say, septic pumping. So if you jump up, if you are looking at the uh, contact stages, I'm going to just jump back here and just show you I clicked on opportunities. Then I clicked into the phase that I went into. So for this one, it was the under contract. Then what we're doing is we jump up to edit stages in the top right-hand corner. So I click on edit stages. Then what we can see here is we can see our checklist items, the stage name and the stage order. And right here, I can simply drag and drop any of these and change the order. But we're going to leave it in this order and we're going to look, come and look in the top right-hand corner where it says add stage. When you click on add stage, this is where you're putting in the name. So we said, let's do our septic. Let's do, yeah, okay, that's fine. Then we're putting in the probability. Uh, this is the probability to that this opportunity will close. So uh, the other ones on this checklist has the probability of 90%. So I'm going to also make this one 90%. And now we're going to drag and drop it. Where do you think it should go? Should it go before Esquivel or after inspection? 
That's an interesting question that you ask. Should it go before escrow or after inspection? And the reason is, is very often when you're dealing with a seller that has a septic system, they want to know if they should actually empty the septic tank before they list. It's a common, common question. I always tell them, no, you don't want to do that. And the reason is, there's a couple of reasons, but one is, um, the biggest is, is that you can't empty a septic system or you shouldn't empty a septic system within a six month span two or three times. You wanna only do it once in a three year span. And the reason is if you know anything about septic systems, there's actually live enzymes that are living within the septic system that actually break down that waste and actually move it out. So if you empty the septic system multiple times within a short period of time, you're actually killing those enzymes. And the more and more you, when you empty a septic system out, just so you know, too, it doesn't empty out completely. It's not, you know, clear to the concrete. They don't vacuum it out. Um, they have to leave those enzymes that are living in there, in there and to actually kill it. So you don't want them to empty it before they list the house. Um, you want to make sure. And if the house stays on the market for six or seven months, you're in trouble, right? Because um, all of a sudden they're filling it back up again. And um and one of the reasons why we say that the sellers need to empty the own, their septic tank is they're responsible for what they put in there, I think. So, so the reality is, is I think it needs to be done after the home inspection. Ben, you clicked off. Did you want to show us more on how to move those around? Uh, yes, I can. If, if anyone wants to ask me specific questions on how to do different things, uh, we can... I can answer those questions now as a, like a q and I love it that where it is and right I, now, by the way. I actually have a question. Yes. Go for it, Stacey. Um, so when you said that you can go in and click off client update, how do you see, at what point does it email that? Is it an automatic email? Do you have to still physically email that to them? Where does the, the spreadsheet live that you can edit what is getting sent to the client? Great so question. So the only ones that are being sent to the clients are if you're within an opportunity itself, so one of these cards, and you go to the bottom right-hand side and you're clicking on, uh, uh, if you're clicking one of the items on. So if this is a text one, right, I can check it on and off that I've done it. They're only going to get the client update if I select the client update for them. Now, a really cool feature that uh, if you click on to the opportunity itself, we can see the details section, buy a profile documents, the normal things that we can see within the opportunity. Up at the top, you can see they actually added this in in order to make us uh, able to see if we actually have client updates going to uh, the consumer or not. So you can see if you have client updates on or off up at the top of your opportunity. You can also see what uh, stage they're in and the checklist items here. And then what we can do is we can see client updates and we can actually select for each opportunity the settings that we want to happen. <coughs> for example, uh, this will, you can select it to be sent uh, daily progress emails for this opportunity. And we can set the time zone and who it gets sent from. And we can suggest, uh, tell who it's being emailed out to. So for example, Allison here is the buyer and I'm the assignee. So, so I right can down set... there, Ben, it says preview. Can you, so are you able to preview the default? Cause you're, it's essentially a default template. Okay. So this is the default preview, but I, what I want you to notice is this dog picture on this top left-hand corner, that's going to be your DBA logo. Then in the top right-hand side, whatever picture that you have loaded into your marketing profile will pop up in this top right-hand corner with this information here. Then whatever you have in as your first name and last name will pop up under where this says John Smith. This will be the same message. We're checking things off the list. Here's a summary of tasks we've completed for 
then this is the live, this text here of the address is actually, I'm going to just jump back to the opportunity here, this right here. So you want to be careful that you are updating this title or the opportunity name title right here to whatever you want that client to be able to see if you are utilizing a client to update. Up that's here, super client... important. That's really, really important to know too, because a lot of times when you're using, you know, DocuSign, zip forms, uh, dot loop, whatever you're using, those details are always private to ourselves when we're naming them, the client isn't seeing them. But exactly, and that's 99% will be the case other than these client updates. Yes. So this is, it. this is key to, to use. So that where this says 4, 4507 Historic Lane, Bellingham, Mass, that's the name of the opportunity. So Ben, can you go back to where that is? Yes. And what we normally do within our market center is we always recommend switching the opportunity name to the company's address or to that address, to the client's address, yep. or the, the, whatever I'm trying to say, the consumer, the, to the house, to the Correct, product. the one they're buying, right? Or the selling. One buying. Or selling. Or selling, exactly. And one of the reasons why you want to do this is because when your market center uh, is, or your MCA at your local market center is trying to pull up the opportunities on the back end, if you have it named as that, they can easily look that information up to uh, find your, your commissions, et cetera. But the other part of it too, is I think it looks very, very nice in my opinion, when you, when they get the email, it says, you know, we're going through the checklist for, and it's the property name. Yes. Especially that reason. Yep. Stacy, does that answer your question? Do you see how it all works? Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess my only other question is, is when you're going through your checklist items, does it get sent as you check another thing off? Like what triggers? Nope. So it's only if you have the client update selected and it will be sent the next morning at 9 a.m. or whatever you have set up under your client updates. So within each opportunity, you can actually go up to the top and click on client updates. And this will allow you to set that information. Uh, then under the checklist items here, it's only the ones that you check off. So for example, what I do is if you have different things filled out here, you can actually just go through and use this as a checklist items you don't have to utilize the client updates unless you want to. Does okay, that so not until you not until you check it off? Does it generate something to correct. the correct? That's correct. correct. Yep. So Ben, what Ben is saying is, is you can use this for your own reference to go mm -hmm. through and say, okay, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, or you can use it as two functions: one to let yourself know that, yep, that's done. We've completed the home inspection, and hey. Here's another touch, by the way. I think it's great to have it because it actually reaches back out to the client, shows super efficiency to the client. And let me just give you guys an example of how people are doing this at a high level. Um, some agents in, within my office, uh, they have detailed lists now for each step of the system all the way through from joined all the way to close. And then what they do is they leverage this with the team or the admin in order to look at each step that they're going through. So the, you're able, they're able to uh, utilize the checklist for themselves to go through and make sure that they're doing all of the different steps from contract to close. So that you don't forget any of those little details that we talked about today. Oh, I need to do the sector. Awesome. What does that involve? Oh, I have to reach out to my septic guy. Oh, I have this person. I have that person. Those can be the different things within your checklist items. Uh, so I just wanted to, to uh, say that uh, under edit stages, when they're going through and putting the checklist items, it can be 
uh, make sure uh, to uh, right. So it could just be that, and then I bought you a closing gift. Uh, I'm sorry, I have caps lock on. I bought you. We thought you were yelling at all of us. Yeah, I know, right? I bought you a So imagine this. So I'm going through my checklist and I needed to go out and buy this person a when I closed, I wanted to make sure to buy this person a closing gift. So I'm going through and I made sure to go out and buy them a closing gift. Then I have another checklist item where I can go, okay, I bought uh, I bought you a closing gift and then you, you, you do the client update. So then they see, oh, you bought them a client up, you bought them a closing gift, awesome. So you can utilize this for your communication as well if you wanted to. So this is really great for, um, so, you know, I mean, it's still used a lot, these forms or forms similar to this. These are the checklists that we use in our office um, or that we have been using in our office. They're physical paper. And part of the reason why they're physical paper is, is in the state of Vermont for many, many years, you had to keep, some people even are, would argue that you still do. You have to keep every single piece of paper that has to do with the transaction. And this was always in the top of my folders when, I would, when it would be that way. You have to store them. You keep them for seven years. They're, it's a required... Uh, for compliance for the state of Vermont. Um, but now what you can do is we've switched and we're probably gonna switch again. We've actually added this to Google Drive. So every client can go in and add the, you know, go through their checklist that they need. This one's, uh, this, one's this, this seller's checklist. So it has all kinds of detail on here, but this is what Ben's talking about. You can actually create this now in command and we don't actually have to have the paper version of it. This for us, happens to be in um, in Google Docs right now. So our so our agents can go in and pull this down, actually use it. They can print it out if they want or use it in Google Drive and update it, obviously make a copy of it um, for themselves. But now these checklists can be done right in command. And the cool part about it is, is when you're going through the checklist, it automatically sends an automated email. Does anyone have any questions about that? Command is a incredible, incredible tool. It's one of the reasons, believe it or not, I moved to KW was for command. And I think it's an awesome tool that not a lot of companies have. Um, and the integration of marketing and the amount of information that you can utilize through that is incredible. So also, uh, just so everyone knows within the chat, I listed the KW answers article for how you can edit your checklists. So if you wanted to revisit what we talked about at the end of this uh, class here, you can definitely do so uh, for your reference. How did everyone like Ignite? Uh, I'm super excited that you were with us today to the end of tonight, today's uh, Ignite session. Super excited. Uh, Michael, was there anything else you wanted to cover? No, today? I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna bring it to a close here. But I'd love to hear, like you just asked, through the whole entire process, what what are some of the ahas you had? What did you learn that you didn't think you knew before? I love the one that Sam had earlier, by the way. Sam, what was that you, you shared with us earlier? Oh, now now you're asking questions about my own memory. <laughs> um, um, oh, it, 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 that. Um, about not being adversarial with the other, um, Correct, uh, the other agents. Yeah. that's just one of those things that I did not know before coming into the business. And, uh, and everybody's like cooperate with the other agents and, and that's whether or not they're KW. Um, although I am finding a lot of KW agents to cooperate with too. Absolutely. Anybody else, any other ahas that we can share with one another? One of my big ahas from doing ignite, uh, this time was, uh, how much more of a connection the technology actually has with the process. Because until you understand the process, you don't understand why you're using the technology or how to even go about knowing how to use the technology to help your clients at a high level. 
So it is something where you want to re go through all of your different classes and at each step of your progression on how much knowledge you're actually gaining with real estate, you want to go back and revisit the technology in order to make sure that you're leveraging it at a level that's going to help your business uh, going forward, do more in production and achieve your dreams. Love it. So it, it's, it's really important to know where you are, know where you're going and know where the resources are and how to leverage them to become successful uh, and to, to make where you want to go your I would add to that, Ben. I would add to that too. Know your tech trainer. Know your market center tech trainer. You want to know somebody who you should get along with, Sam? Your market center tech trainer. <laughs> Super important. Anybody else with any ahas, anything? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, Ben. Sorry. The other person with a great name. Sorry. Ben Thank ben. you very much, Ben. Love that. <laughs> Um, my big got? ahas, you know, I moved down to Rhode Island uh, via Southern Vermont shortly before the pandemic. And uh, being very concerned about my sphere, I started to complain about it early on. I got called out for that. Um, we have some winter weather coming. I looked at my social media. I've got over a thousand contacts. When I was running out of contacts to put it in command and so going through my phone, I thought, what the heck? I'll just put five people from social media that maybe I don't know and try to discover the connection. Three out of five people are responding with me. And even though I may not get a great connection as to how we know each other, what do you do? What do you, you know, oh, I work for a bank. Oh, that's great. I work in real estate. Where are you at in the world? And I might have already looked at there in Seattle or something. But at, at least I'm communicating with people and I'm not just sitting here waiting for the phone to ring. That's great. It's, it's not going to. So I'm just trying to find really creative ways of just building that sphere and, um, I think I might have two referrals that I'm working on. They may take some time. They're, you know, they're still getting nurtured and developed, but that's 25%, which is better than zero. Great for you, Ben. I love it. That's awesome. So there's my that's really uh, great. worrying about leads and things. You got to get out there, right? I think someone said at the beginning, uh, Roberto said 10 real estate conversations a day. And by the way, that can be with the person that's serving you the coffee or the latte or whatever it is you choose, monster. I don't know. Um, whoever is selling it, that can be your conversation. Any other ahas before we jump off? Um, go ahead, I'll, I'll go. Um, kind of going off of what Ben just said, I'm kind of surprised with... Um, you know, I did a social media post to say, oh, I'm in real estate. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, like, that's great. But it wasn't until I started actually contacting these people directly, did I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm surprised by who actually responded to me that I didn't think necessarily would. And the opportunity of referral programs or um, how we can work together, um, I don't think that, you know, obviously that opportunity could have always been lingering and sitting out there. But had I not contacted them directly, would I have ever known that it existed? And so I think for me, it really made me a believer in, um, you know, reaching out to people because you never know. There's somewhere in KU I learned this. You need 80, 80, 80 calls or 80 reach outs. You need to touch people 80 times. 80 goes down to 40 contacts. So out of the 80 people, you're gonna actually reach 40 contacts and make 40 contacts. Out of those 40 contacts, you're gonna have 20 quality conversations about real estate. And that's what Stacy's talking about. So 80 to 40 to 20. From those 20 actual real quality conversations, you're gonna end up with five appointments. Hopefully, right? You start with 80, you end up with five actual appointments, whether they're listing appointments or buying consultations. Out of those five, you should have at least four that you definitely make those appointments happen, that you attend four appointments from those five. 
And from those four appointments, you should get one signed contract. So that just goes to show you, start big and it comes down to what you need. So make as many contacts and conversations as you can. Like I said, five or six years ago, we were talking about having two conversations a day. In this seller's market, you need to have 10 conversations a day, real estate conversations a day, 10 of them to actually be successful. If you take that 10 and you can multiply it, do it. If you have the time to do it, you should do it. Um, if anyone else doesn't have any other ahas or comments or questions, I want to thank, actually, before I go through my thanks, I want to thank Ben for sure. Ben, can you... You want to have a closing comment before you go? I appreciate everything you did for me on command today because you're much better at it than I am. So my, my closing comment is, I'm, I'm going to remind all of you again. We, we go through our real estate careers and we are at game day or when we're talking with that client, we want to practice beforehand. We want to make sure that we know our scripts beforehand. Practice, practice, practice. Practice with people in your office, with people not in your office, with your friends, family, because every time you practice, I always think to myself, this is one conversation that I'm not going to screw up in the future. So I always just like to think that way. Practice, practice, practice. And then also leverage your technology in order to be able to focus more on, on yourself. For example, utilize the smart plans to send out automation of emails and text messages. Set up different smart plans in order to help you know which tasks to do when. Utilize the KW Command app on your phone that will allow you to uh, when you go and text people, when you call people, when you email people, the next time you go through the same the command app, it will prompt you to take that note. So just by, sim by switching simple behaviors or simple habits, we can really take our business to the next level. Uh, it all comes down to making positive habits or the, taking the correct habits and doing it every day uh, that you're in business. So. Uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to say uh, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope to see you all in future Ignite sessions, because like my big thing is, self-education never stops. Awesome, Ben. Thanks so much. Hey, so I really appreciate everybody joining in today. I really loved it. This is my first Ignite program as uh, the brand new PC up in Vermont. And uh, if I can be of service to any of you, please feel free to contact me. You can find me on the KW Vermont website. Um, but always, always forget, be of service, always, always remember to be of service to your community, be of service to your clients, be of service to the, your family. Most importantly, be of service to yourself. Thanks, everybody, for joining in today. And I look forward to seeing the future and good luck in your real estate career. Have a great one. Thank Have a good one. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.